Bonjour, mesdames et messieurs. Merci d'être venu à cette conférence de l'Institut Macdonald-Laurier portant sur la sécurité maritime dans l'Indo-Pacifique. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm Brian Lee Crowley, and I am the managing director of the Macdonald-Laurier Institute, and I'd like to welcome you to this special event called Troubled Waters, Navigating the Maritime Security Challenges of the Indo-Pacific. Now, a number of you in the audience are old hands at MLI events, but some of you are new. So I beg the indulgence of the former if I say a word of introduction for the latter about the Institute. When I founded MLI 10 years ago, and yes, it is about to be our 10th birthday, it was to fill what I thought of as a glaring void in Canada's democratic infrastructure. We did not have, uh, in spite of being a G7 capital, we did not have a national think tank in the national capital talking about national issues to national policymakers, the national media, and the national electorate. Um, we think that we have now filled that gap uh, with, I immodestly believe, some success. Uh, in 2013, we were ranked one of the top three new think tanks in the world. Uh, our first book won the big international prize for think tank publications, the Sir Anthony Fisher Prize. Uh, we won a Templeton Award for Outstanding Performance by a Young Think Tank. And last year, we were ranked the top social policy think tank in North America for our work on the justice system. And in the last year, we deeply influenced the legislation on the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People and the revision of the way that we will go about buying new fighter jets, to pick just a few examples of some of our areas of interest and of our reach and breadth. One of our new departures in the last year or two has been terrific events like this one. Uh, in this case, under the leadership of Jonathan Miller, who I will introduce in a moment. Uh, for now, I will just say that this event has attracted uh, representation from uh, many, many diplomatic missions in, uh, in Ottawa, for example, Belgium, South Korea, India, Hungary, Japan, Taiwan, France, the Philippines, Israel, Vietnam, Mexico, New Zealand, Australia, Russia, Malaysia, Honduras, Indonesia, Romania are the ones that I have on my list. Uh, and uh, there are people here from many of the key departments in government, uh, DND, Global Affairs, Indigenous Relations, the National Research Council, PCO, the Senate, Canadian Coast Guard, the Royal Canadian Navy. And I am delighted, uh, as we always are, to see uh, a number of our uh, soldiers and sailors in uniform. You are always extremely welcome at our events. Uh, and this is all, this turnout is all in spite of the fact that we are in competition with the announcement of the new cabinet. And so I would like to say well done to Jonathan and his colleagues for what I think is going to be uh, an outstanding event. Uh, on to the topic of our event today. The Indo-Pacific is facing a host of shared community com security challenges from maritime piracy and crime to heated territorial disputes. In this vast maritime space, stretching from East Africa to the Pacific Island chains, the foundations of regional commerce and security are secured through the freedom of navigation and secure sea lanes. There's great opportunity uh, in the region with large economies and diverse fast-paced growth in many middle-sized economies. That said, alongside this economic growth, is a large demand for infrastructure. Uh, some estimate the need for more than $4 trillion in infrastructure spending over the next few years. To fill this void, several regional powers have the wherewithal to work with other states in the region to create a sustainable path based on fair lending, transparent institutions, and long-term growth. Yet there are a number of key challenges to the rules and order in the region that have underpinned security and prosperity for the states that border the Indo-Pacific Basin. In the South China Sea, to pick one example, Beijing continues to practice what we call salami slicing tactics aimed at ensuring its de facto control of much of this key waterway through extensive land reclamation accompanied by militarization in disputed areas. Meanwhile, Beijing also continues to raise regional concerns through its constant incursions into the maritime and airspace surrounding Japan's Senkaku Islands, also claimed by China, in the East China Sea. To shed light on these issues, we're pleased to bring together some of the leading thinkers from Canada and the world to discuss the key maritime challenges in the Indo-Pacific and how Canada can and should become an indispensable partner along like-minded allies 
uh, in ensuring a free and open maritime environment in the region. I'd like to introduce now uh, our moderator for today's event, who I've already referred to, Jonathan Miller. Uh, Jonathan is an international affairs professional with expertise on security, defense, and intelligence issues in Northeast Asia. He is an MLI senior fellow, and he is a uh, deputy director of our Center for Advancing Canada's Interests Abroad. He has held a variety of positions in the public and private sector, including nearly a decade working on economic and security issues related to Asia with the Canadian federal government. In addition to his affiliation with MLI, he's also a senior fellow with the Japan Institute of International Affairs. He holds appointments as Canada's ASEAN Regional Forum expert and eminent person. I've always wanted to meet an eminent person, Jonathan. Uh, uh, and as a responsible leader, not to be confused with those other kinds of leaders, as a responsible leader for the BMW Foundation. Jonathan, will you come to the podium? I don't sometimes feel so eminent, but, uh, but thank you nonetheless. And good morning, everyone. Thank you, uh, thank you for joining. Um, as uh, Brian noted, it's, uh, it's quite an interesting timing here that we have this aligned with the same day as the cabinet announcement. Uh, we had planning an event like this takes a bit of time, so this is something that we didn't uh, plan and orchestrate this way. So uh, you know, you could be excused if your phones are buzzing off in the next couple hours and there's a lot of whispers uh, happening around on, on the, the cabinet gossip. But I think um, when thinking about this, uh, number one, I'm, I'm delighted that you've all decided to choose our event and, uh, and uh, join this discussion and conversation, with, with, which I hope this becomes less uh, a form of us telling you about the Indo-Pacific and more of a conversation with you and us on this region. Um, this is also very important, I think, on this day, especially with the cabinet being announced. Uh, from Canada's perspective. Today we're going to hear perspectives from, from Vietnam, from Japan, from the US, and from others, uh, including uh, uh, Canadian perspectives on the Indo-Pacific. But especially with this day, with the new cabinet coming in, looking about how Canada approaches uh, its uh, new strategy or its new vision, its new concept to the Indo-Pacific. So I think this provides us a really important chance and important timing for this. Um, one of the, you know, when, when referencing this kind of region and when talking about the Indo-Pacific, which is, I think has become a bit of a buzzword now in, uh, uh, in regional politics, I think it's important to actually get to the fundamental point, what are we talking about? Um, so uh, usually as a, you know, a former uh, and recovering public servant, uh, I'm allergic to the idea of PowerPoint. But for this uh, example, I think, and for this specific event, I think it's important to have a few instructive slides. And this is just one uh, map that we see uh, behind me. Uh, this is actually from an Australian think tank, the Lowy Institute, on their kind of idea of the free and open Indo-Pacific. You can see, here's another one, a more generic map that you kind of would, would find through a Google search that kind of looks at basically scoping from the east coast of Africa all the way to uh, potentially to Hawaii and to, uh, and to South America. And this is another one of the uh, United States' newly branded, uh, formerly Pacific Command, but now Indo-Pacific Command. And I think the reason why I show you these different maps, and I think, number one, it's important to have an idea where this region is and, and why this is important. But number one, they're all connected to the seas. And I think when looking at the Indo-Pacific, and often I get asked this question about, you know, what's the, what's the, what's the importance of Indo-Pacific versus Asia-Pacific? And I say not so much to focus on the terminology and the semantics itself, but it's what's under the hood. So whether uh, some of the issues that I think Brian referenced, but I think will be, uh, I'm sure, detailed in, in much more um, terms by our, our panelists, but things such as the freedom of navigation and overflight, uh, peaceful resolution of, of disputes and ensuring that there's not coercive ways by one party to solve disputes. Uh, but most importantly, I think fundamentally is the ad adherence to international law. I think this is something that uh, obviously Canada stands very closely to and I think is shared by most of the countries that are represented today. Um, so, with, uh, with that being said, um, you know, I won't uh, abuse the, uh, the privilege of the moderator anymore, but I would like to introduce uh, my team today and my panelists, um, and then they can take the stage afterwards. I think some of you have seen their, their biographies, and I think they're very well known, so I won't, uh, I won't go into the, the long version. I'll give the Cliff Notes versions of their, of their, uh, their backgrounds. But first, we have, uh, speaking from the United States side, uh, Greg Poling who's the uh, director of the Asia Maritime Transparency, 
transparency initiative um, from CSIS. And I think Greg, uh, uh, I think of if you, um, if you Google the South China Sea, if you Google image the South China Sea, a couple things you'll see is uh, sometimes you'll see the nine dash line and then you'll see Greg's face. Uh, <laughs> He's, uh, he's, uh, he's, he's a very famous and uh, a guy on these issues. Uh, I think he's done a lot of work. Uh, we were talking just before this conference that he seems to never be in Washington. So while we got him uh, in Washington, I think we're very fortunate that we got him in between his Asia travels. Uh, following Greg, we have uh, uh, Dr. Hikotani Takako, uh, who is a professor of modern Japanese politics and foreign policy at Columbia University in New York. Uh, and also uh, Hikotani-san uh, and I share uh, one former affiliation, uh, she had spent several years at the National Defense Academy, uh, which I've had the chance to go to several times, but she also um, had a stint at uh, Japan's National Institute of Defense Studies, uh, which uh, I had the chance in their new building to be their first um, uh, foreign visiting fellow uh, in uh, 2017. Uh, so she is very uh, uh, a good person to talk to from a J Japanese perspective on defense and security issues. The, uh, our following uh, Hikotani-san, we have uh, Dr. Tanvi Madan, uh, who is the senior fellow in the Project on International Order and Strategy uh, at the Brookings Institution and uh, the director of the India Project. So she, again, uh, focuses most of, much of her research on India's relationship and, and geostrategic position with the US and also with China. Uh, and then closing out the, the last two members, we have, uh, we have uh, Dr. Julie Nguyen, uh, who is co-founder and director of the Canada-Vietnam Trade Council and also has a role here in Canada at York University. Uh, and then last, but absolutely not least, uh, uh, Dr. Batillier, uh, who I like to think of as the czar of, uh, of uh, Asia-Pacific, Indo-Pacific uh, security issues in Canada, very well known, I'm sure, to many in this crowd. Uh, so I said that uh, I've given him full uh, liberty uh, to, uh, to speak his mind now as, a, as also, a, a, I, I believe, a former uh, public servant at this point. So happy retirement. and. Uh, and uh, welcome to your, your remarks. So uh, if I can ask the panelists to uh, please uh, join the stage. And uh, uh, Greg, I think we'll be starting us off. The, the, basically, the way this is going to run is the uh, panelists will speak for about seven minutes uh, each. And then we'll have a, a moderated discussion. Uh, and uh, at 11.45, you'll all have your chance. So you can think about now about your compelling questions and hard-hitting uh, insights uh, to, uh, to deliver to our panel. So, so thank you for coming. Good morning, and, and thanks uh, first off to Jonathan and to MLI for the invitation. It is my first time in Ottawa. It could not come at a better time. I don't know if you know, but politics is a little difficult at the moment in Washington. When I was flying out of Reagan last night, they were blaring the, the live coverage of the impeachment hearings on every television in the airport. So I'm just happy to unplug for the next 24 hours. Uh, I've got seven minutes, and I think to start, as the American, uh, it behooves me to talk about the administration's free and open Indo-Pacific strategy, prefaced with the fact that it is not a strategy. Starting with that, um, we have been waiting now for two years, more than two years, since we heard this first talked about by President Trump at the APEC summit in Vietnam in 2017. The State Department has been telling people, don't worry, there will be some public uh, guidelines on what exactly the free and open Indo-Pacific means. Is it different than the Obama administration's pivot? Is there anything really to it? Finally, two weeks ago, the State Department released an Indo-Pacific report uh, on the sidelines of the ASEAN summits in Bangkok that in its preface said very clearly, this is not a strategy document. We still don't have one of those. This is just a fact sheet of everything we've done in the Indo-Pacific. If you step back, though, and look at the kind of the formative statements issued by then Secretaries Tillerson and Mattis, then National Security Advisor H.R. McMaster, and dive into both the Pentagon's May Indo-Pacific report and now this new State Department report, you find three consistent themes that are clearly at the heart of, of what the administration thinks is their strategic vision. One is providing an alternative, perhaps not a counter, that might be too strong a word, but an alternative 
to Chinese infrastructure funding in the Indo-Pacific through the Belt and Road Initiative. And that's where we've seen the most activity, whether it's the passage of the Build Act and the increase of U.S. lending facilities for the region, the announcement of a new Blue Dot Network alongside Japan and Australia to uh, help provide guidelines on, on infrastructure investment, and on and on. The second component, which I'll talk about more, is the South China Sea. Uh, they talk about sea lanes of communication, freedom of the seas, or freedom of navigation and other lawful uses of the sea, all of that are euphemisms for the South China Sea um, because that is fundamentally where the U.S. sees maritime law and norms under threat in the Indo-Pacific. The third component is free, fair, and reciprocal trade, that being the tagline, which of course means picking trade fights with every U.S. partner and ally in the Indo-Pacific, much as we are in the rest of the world. So the, the biggest problem with the strategy is that one of the components fundamentally undermines the other two. Uh, the U.S. cannot provide alternatives to the BRI, nor can it push back successfully on Chinese incursion in the South China Sea alone. And yet it seems intent on pursuing a trade policy intended to alienate partners and allies around the region. So that done, uh, I'm not going to talk about the South China Sea rather than where the U.S. has fallen short on the South China Sea. The reason that I'm up at the podium, because Jonathan asked me to bring along a couple of maps, and the one I always start with looks like this, because most often when we talk about the South China Sea or if you read about it from the press, you tend to see people refer to it as a territorial dispute. That is problematic. There are two kinds of disputes in the South China Sea. There is a territorial dispute over sovereignty over the Paracel Islands, the Spratly Islands, the Scarborough Shoal. That has nothing to do with outside parties, be it the United States or Canada, except that we insist that those territorial disputes not be resolved via force but we have no stake in the ultimate state of resolution. On top of that, you have a maritime dispute, and that is fundamentally a problem for the entire international community because the international community established the uh, UN Convention on the Law of the Sea in 1982, came into force in 1994. Even those countries like my own, which have failed to ratify it, consider it inter customary international law binding upon all states. And the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea is quite clear. You get to claim territorial sea, 200 mile exclusive economic zone and a continental shelf from your land features, period. China claims a 1,000 mile nine dash line throughout the entire South China Sea in clear contravention of international law. An international court ruled as much in July 2016. Beijing's position is effectively that Vietnam, the Philippines, and Malaysia, uniquely among all the UN members, do not get an exclusive economic zone. Their exclusive economic zone must be shared with China, at the very least. So this is deeply problematic for outside parties. You know, both the United States and Canada are trading nations. We are maritime nations. We have long invested in the notion of freedom of the seas, of the seas of the maritime commons. You cannot have that system survive in a world in which the number two, perhaps in the next couple of decades, the number one power in the world does not have to follow any of those rules, in which China can simply declare a thousand miles of sovereign rights because it has the bigger boats and the bigger guns. So U.S. interests and most outside parties' interests, um, be they Australia, the French, the British, the Japanese, the reasons that they're sailing through the South China Sea, the reason that they're constantly talking about it, is one, concern that China's claims in the South China Sea will undermine fundamental principles of international law, leading to an unwinding of a system that we spent decades negotiating. Two, we are deeply concerned that China will resort to force to resolve these issues which for the U.S. could mean a direct conflict because of our treaty alliance with the Philippines. And for pretty much everyone, it means instability in the region and undermining the position of the U.S. as a security provider in the region. The biggest change to the status quo, the reason we've gone from the South China Sea being a largely academic problem that was talked about among Southeast Asia watchers to something on the top of the priority list of virtually every international summit is this. At the end of 2013, China began a massive, unprecedented campaign to build new land figures in the South China Sea. In roughly 18 months, it created 3,200 acres of new land by intentionally digging up roughly 15,000 acres of coral reef, destroyed another 25,000 acres via illegal clam harvesting. All of that led to three new air and naval bases in the Spratlys, this being Mischief Reef, the largest of the three, along with several smaller features. China today operates three 3,000-meter airstrips and massive naval facilities 
in a place where until four or five years ago, it was very rare to see a Chinese boat. Chinese ships would come out from Hainan, they would do a couple weeks sail by, and they'd have to go home. That's no longer the case. Now there are Chinese law enforcement, naval, and militia ships throughout the Nine Dash Line, day in and day out. Meaning that if you are a Filipino fisher, a Vietnamese oil and gas operator, a Malaysian Coast Guard vessel, you are pretty much guaranteed to be harassed, coerced, and intimidated by a Chinese force, whether paramilitary or military, every time you sail into the South China Sea. And the biggest change that we've seen over the last two years has been as all of the infrastructure on these islands becomes fully operational, China has begun to home port not just its Coast Guard and its Navy ships in the Spratlys, but hundreds of its maritime militia vessels. This is an image of Subi Reef, one of the three Chinese air and naval bases. There are over 150 meter plus fishing boats in that image. On any given day, there are more than 300 Chinese fishing boats in the Spratly Islands not fishing. They never fish. They never broadcast AIS. If they were commercial fishers, they all would have been bankrupt years ago. The only thing they do is serve as eyes and ears for the PLA and the CCG and get deployed, for instance, when the Filipinos decide to repair one of their runways or when the Vietnamese decide to engage in oil and gas work that China doesn't like. The purpose being to keep this below the threshold of military force, prevent the US or any other outside power from finding an excuse to intervene, but in the meantime, slowly push Southeast Asians out of their waters. Because if you are a Vietnamese oil and gas operator, as we just learned over four months because of the standoff over Vanguard Bank, you now have to engage in your economic activities in the face of dozens of Chinese Coast Guard ships, dozens, maybe a hundred or more of these maritime militia vessels, intentionally creating risks of collision, trying to make it so that no commercial entity with sane mind would consider any activity in the South China Sea reasonable. And that is the end goal, and China is succeeding. In five to 10 years, the South China Sea will be a Chinese lake. Whether or not anybody agrees to the legal foundation of China's claims, no economic activity will happen in the South China Sea without China say so. That is deeply problematic. And I'll wrap up there. Thanks a lot, Greg. Um, Good morning. Um, it is a great pleasure for me to be here. Um, unlike Greg, if you Google my name and, and Google South China Sea, you're not going to get anything until today, which means that I'm relatively new to this topic. So I did. I would like to not pretend to talk about what I don't know, but to stick to what I do know is whether and how Japan's adapting to the situation um, surrounding Japan, especially the troubled water issue. And just as an introduction, there's two things that I like to say is not happening, is that um, I was at an event at Columbia just last week, and there was a speaker who asked me, uh, there was a commentator who said that, um, I get the impression that Japan is now trying to look more coastal now, and not maritime. Um, because Japan is trying to have a very friendlier relationship with China and Russia, it's true that Prime Minister Abe has been meeting with Xi Jinping and Putin quite often. There was supposed to be a meeting with Xi during about the time of the cherry blossoms. But um, it is, I was kind of surprised because I thought it was like a given that Japan was a maritime power. And I think that although there, would, there is our geographical reasons why Japan might want to have a friendly relationship with the countries close to us, Japan is definitely a maritime power. And relationship with countries such as Canada is very important to us. Um, Japan's um, EEZ is 12 times the size of the land. It's actually six in the world if you, it is a very big size. And the ADIZ stresses, if you plot Europe on top of Japan, it actually stretches from Portugal to Poland. So it's actually quite a big space if you think about the larger um, size of Japan. This is something that I'm not, the point that's been emphasized by the um, self-defense forces in their multiple um, um, guidelines or presentations on where they stand on the issue. So this is very much aware in Japan's defense strategy that Japan is not just bound by the land, but there's a big space around, which makes it very important for Japan to keep its maritime, um, the seas around Japan to be more safe. Um, the others, we have 6,852 6, islands, which is something I didn't know of. But, um, and we're trying to cover or defend this place with um, the size of the Japan Japanese Maritime Self-Defense Force being 40, about just, a, just about 43,000 
and um, which is about the size of the capacity of one of the bigger baseball stadiums in Japan, which is the Tokyo Dome. So in a way, we're trying to cover a lot of like space with a relatively limited force, not just the budget, but personnel-wise. So although there might be developments in terms of how many ships we have, it is quite limited, and that makes it even more important for us to cooperate with other countries. Um, the other point that's been raised by some Japanese scholars as well is that the free and open Indo-Pacific in Japan has sort of evolved from something that was more in line with the Quad idea or something that's more in line with um, Prime Minister Abe's article um, that he wrote in 2012 about security, democratic security diamond in Asia that is less confrontational, is more cooperative towards China, and it's le much less about the security component. Um, this, although I could see some change in the language, that now we don't call it a strategy, we call it a vision now, I don't think it's quite true either. I think it's just that we're not way, like, um, calling, the, the, the main focus does not seem to be the quad, but there's important things happening that do underlie the importance Japan places on the security component of the free and open Indo-Pacific strategy. So I think that is still there, and it's not a transition, from security focus to a non-security focus, but that is just a point of emphasis maybe given the nature of the bilateral relationship we're trying to establish with China. Um, so that, I think today I'd like to point out the two points or two uh, key terms maybe, looking at Japan's strategy and agenda for Japan going forward is seamless and synergy. Um, and before I get to that, um, as I try to prepare for the speech, I, I'm happy to learn that there's a lot of things going on between Japan and Canada. Um, just on November 6th, the Can Canadian Navy frigate um, Ottawa visited the port of Kure. Following four months of operations, participated in Operation Neon to patrol the waters and prevention of ship to ship transfers by North Korea based on the UN Security Council Resolution 2375. So that means that, and, and also in November 14th, following the Kure visit, um, the Canadian Navy is participating in US Japan annual ex exercise together with Australia near the seas of Japan. Um, this is um, another a bilateral part of the um, effort is Kaidex, which is the bilateral um, Navy exercise between Japan and Canada, which started in 2017. Kaide is actually uh, the Japanese translation of the word maple. Um, and that I'm wearing a maple badge. I did not pick it up at the airport last night, uh, but um, I went to a school uh, that was established by Canadian missionaries in 1884 in Tokyo. So that's, this comes from the school. But anyway, Kaidex is a very interesting name because it has the maple and it's an exercise. But anyway, that has started in 2017. And I was very surprised, and this follows up from um, the 2018 agreement between Japan and Canada on acquisition and cross-servicing agreement and the joint declaration of security cooperation between the two defense ministers in June 2019. And I was most surprised to hear, which is related to what I'm gonna say in the end, that the Japanese ground self-defense force chief of um, staff Goro Yuasa visited Ottawa in October this year. And so that is very new because this is not Navy and it's an army um, component. So turning to the topic of East Asian Sea, uh, um, what is Japan doing? Um, and I'm curious to know what your perception is, that do you think that Japan is not doing enough, given that what's happening with China and the buildup of Chinese Coast Guard ships, it has tripled um, since 2020 to 2017. Um, and still the Japanese Coast Guard, which is the first line of defense, is relatively small. Um, and also, given that the growing A2AD capabilities makes, since it makes southern western islands of Japan look more vulnerable, um, are you puzzled that there might, there doesn't seem to be that much going on in Japan uh, to, in relation to that. Um, if you're expecting like a doubling of the defense budget, it is not happening. I don't think it's gonna happen any too too, but there has been things that are in play, especially in relationship the new defense program outline that was announced in 2018, which I think is notable, both for, once again, the, um, the seamlessness or the effort to make things more seamless and synergy. Um, seamless is especially important um, in terms of the relationship between Japan Coast Guard and the Japanese Maritime Self-Defense Force. Once again, um, Japan's Coast Guard is the first responder to any contingency happening in this area. But still, there are more efforts to improve the communication between the Japan Coast Guard and Japanese Service Defense Forces and exercises that are in play to tr try to improve um, how they can collaborate with each other. Still, there are issues to be solved. There are very different organizations, and it is true that there has been changes in China which makes their side of 
operations be more seamless, but Japan is trying to make themselves more seamless too on this regard. Um, also, the, following the 2013 um, National Program to Defense, the outline maintenance of and try to enforce the area of maritime superiority um, by having more F-15s in Narita, uh, I mean Naha, excuse me. Um, they are going to um, be of that effort in 2018 National Program Defense Scout Line, as well as increase the ships um, by increasing submarine fleet from 18 to 20, uh, 16 to 22, Aegis vessels from 6 to 8, and developing new multi-role figure uh, uh, for counter mine and anti-submarine. And one thing that you might have seen in the news is that we're going to have an airport, aircraft carrier, uh, which is not entirely true, or it is, but it's still not called an aircraft carrier. It's called a multi role like aircraft carrier, and it's, going to, it's, it's more of a refurbishment of what we have, but that is to create a potential to operate F-35Bs, which we're going to focus on um, purchase, purchasing in the future. Um, the other component that is really new, which re is reflective of the effort at the defense level, is the joint defense force concept, which is aiming to have a more seamless operation between the three forces of Japan. Um, I taught at the National Defense Academy of Japan for um, 18 years, and it is a tri-service academy. Um, but there, un unfortunately, um, the self-defense forces is not known for its seamless operation. They are not very, very different organizations that has a very different focus or had been in the past. But there has been more interest among the ground self-defense force to actually take a role or have a role in what's happening in the southwest part of Japan. Um, and their goal right now is to be um, agile, um, dynamic defense force. And there's three things that's happening at the army level or the ground self-defense force level that is related to this, is that there are going to be coastal observ observance units in Yonaguni um, and um, Amami Oshima and the four islands including those two um, to be placed. And there's going to be an effort to be able to rapidly deploy um, robust forces from um, other parts of Japan. But the problem still, and they're going to develop an amphibious force to recapture invaded islands. Still, the agenda is lack of sea lift and airlift air air capacity. Uh, one thing that's also new in regards to East China Sea for Japan, which is related to possibility for cooperation is that Australian and Canadian surveillance aircraft are stationed now to Kadena under the UN Command Status of Force Agreement for the ship to ship transfers. And although this is meant for the North Korean um, ship to ship transfers, it does create an opportunity for Japan to work with other countries, not just the US in its alliance relationship, which I think is very important for Japan going forward. Um, next for the South China Sea, I think what's most important, not to overlap with what um, Rex said is that what Japan is doing, which is basically um, has been um, since 2010, so which is prior to the Abe administration and the free and open in the Pacific as we know it now, is the capacity building efforts in on the South China Sea. Um, the Viantin vision was um, announced in 2016, but the efforts to try to strengthen par partnership with Southeast Asian countries to build their capacities for maritime security began prior to that during the previous administration, which is the DPJ administration, uh, Democratic Party of Japan administration. So this is something that is a bipartisan effort, and it combines Japan's strength in terms of what they have, what they can offer for capacity of building, like maritime law education, training for disaster relief, and so forth in these countries, which build upon what Japan can do more than what Japan is not able to do for constitutional and legal reasons. And there has been an announcement by Prime Foreign Minister Kono at, uh, of Viantian 2.0 just this past month um, at the a ADAM or ASEAN Defense Minister's meeting. And why it's 2.0? Oh, why there's a new, visit, a new version is that I think there's awareness that the situation in South China Sea, given uh, China's um, progress in what they're doing, has become a much more of an urgent issue. And they're trying to promote, uh, maybe bring in some ground self-defense force effort in having established a more relationship between uh, the ground forces of the Southeast Asian countries with regards to areas that they can work on. Um, and so finally, so it's the seamlessness and synergy that the Japan is trying to do among its forces between the Japanese Coast Guard and the Self-Defense Force and hopefully with partner countries in the region.
So finally, for um, areas of cooperation between Japan and Canada, I do hope that there's more efforts to jointly collaborate, not just in the East China Sea for the ship to ship, but that to expand to more efforts in the South China Sea for um, disaster, uh, I mean, humanitarian things and um, peacekeeping efforts and capacity building on that end as well, all, um, while working harder on the Navy, Navy to Navy relationship between the countries um, on, in the East Asia, East China Sea. Thank you very much. Well, thank you uh, so much, uh, Higatani Sensei. A very good uh, and comprehensive presentation. Um, Tamvi, if I could ask you to come next, and uh, we're running a little bit short on time, so if, if everybody could just be um, as, as much as they can, stick to the seven minutes, that'd be great. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Jonathan. Um, and it's, I'm delighted to be here as well, especially on what I hear is a balmy day in Ottawa. And this would not be considered a balmy day in DC. Um, and thank you to the um, MLI as well for hosting this. Um, I was asked to talk about uh, kind of how India sees uh, the Indo-Pacific um, and is ensuring or sees the kind of maritime security challenges uh, in uh, the Indo-Pacific region. India had actually been quite reluctant to embrace this concept uh, and of the Indo-Pacific, this kind of integrated um, region taking uh, into account both the Indian Ocean and Pacific, Asia Pacific regions. Um, but there, it has in recent years officially embraced this concept. Um, so much so that the ultimate sign of embracing this concept officially, there is now uh, a new division in the Indian Foreign Ministry that focuses on the Indo-Pacific. And the Indian Foreign Minister try, likes to point out that is, India is the first uh, of the Quad countries, at least, that has set up such a division. So why has India now kind of embraced this concept that it was reluctant to embrace? Uh, Reality is on the ground, or rather uh, in this maritime space. Um, for one, uh, India's own interests uh, and part uh, partnerships in the region uh, extend beyond kind of the immediate uh, Indian Ocean uh, region area. Uh, just to give you one example, 55% of India's trade uh, goes through the Strait of Malacca. Um, the other kind of aspect that has changed kind of India's view of this region is China's increasing activities uh, and influence in the Indian Ocean region. Um, and there's this general sense in India now that what happens in one oceanic region will not stay in that oceanic region. And so that there is kind of this idea that this is an integrated space, and in fact, in many ways, is going back to the historical norm that the separation is actually quite recent. Um, there is an added benefit for India in terms of how it sees this uh, uh, region as kind of integrated, which is that it actually, India has benefited um, from other countries' embrace of this concept. Uh, since it actually, for example, in the US concept of it, it actually elevates India's role, not just in terms of kind of Asia Pacific strategies, but in terms of those countries' broader strategies as well. So how does India define the Indo-Pacific? In this sense, it's kind of different a little bit from the US, where it does kind of cover the expanse uh, that Jonathan pointed out. Um, all the way to the uh, kind of east coast, uh, so it's from the west coast of the U.S. to the east coast uh, of Africa. Uh, the U.S. concept uh, stops at uh, the, east, uh, the west coast of India. And what it wants, I mean, very much kind of like um, kind of the Japanese concept, uh, India is quite particular, has said um, for a while uh, that India does not, it doesn't have an Indo-Pacific strategy. It has a vision of the Indo-Pacific. And what it wants to see is a free, open, and inclusive uh, region. And I can come back to that later. But when it says free and open, it means in terms of countries having not about the nature of regimes in countries, but that countries should have the freedom to choose. And when India kind of looks out on this region, it sees um, both opportunities and challenges. Um, it sees many of the benefits from this region as being economic. That is, this region can contribute to Indian prosperity. Um, it sees many of the risks uh, in terms of security risks, uh, you, not just from uh, non-state actors, uh, but increasingly uh, related to concerns about Chinese capabilities, actions, and intentions. Um, and it sees the existing regional order as inadequate to deal with some of these risks and challenges that it now um, sees in the region. Uh, what are India's kind of objectives in the region? It wants to obviously maximize benefits and minimize risks. Uh, it is very particular about saying that it wants the a maintenance of a rules-based order, um, which is crucial uh, in this region for 
uh, Indian Security and Economic Growth. The principles it outlines are many of the ones Jonathan mentioned, including peaceful resolution of disputes, following international law, freedom of navigation and overflight, etc. It also wants to see the maintenance of a favorable, favorable balance of power in the region. It wants a multipolar Asia, that is, it does not want to see any single power dominate. Um, it wants to particularly secure the Indian Ocean region and ideally remain the primary actor in the Northern Indian Ocean region. And it wants to kind of use this region as a springboard uh, to enhance its own global role. What is the approach it's taken in this region? So one aspect of its approach is managing its relationship uh, with China, uh, where it has a number of differences, um, but it also has been seeking to engage uh, China and kind of maintain an equilibrium in that re relationship or at least stabilize it. And it essentially, its approach towards China is what I like to call competitive engagement. And we can talk about that more if you'd like in Q&A. Uh, but I want to focus a little bit on kind of the other, other leg of the approach uh, to the Indo-Pacific. And it's encompassed in various terms. India has a neighborhood first policy. It has an act east policy. It now has an act far east policy. But essentially, all this involves that in, the re in this kind of broader region, it involves India enhancing its diplomatic, economic, military, and even cultural engagement with a wide, wide variety of actors. And if you think about India's priority areas, it starts kind of in, and goes in terms of concentric circles. Immediate priority area is kind of the immediate Indian Ocean region, particularly the South Asian neighbors that India has, then moving out to kind of in, in increasing in engagement with Southeast Asia. And then that third set is to work with major powers or like-minded partners. Uh, and yes, it is the other Quad countries that have got the most attention, the US, Japan, and Australia. But India also sees other partners, uh, France um, as well, uh, and, and Russia, which is, uh, obviously makes it different from, for example, how the US sees the region, and to some extent, extent the United Kingdom. It's been engaging with these countries, whether in South Asia, Southeast Asia, and with the major powers bilaterally, trilaterally, quadrilaterally, and through regional institutions. Um, and it has been kind of working with them to enhance essentially, and I'll end on this since we're talking about maritime security. It is working with all these countries to work in its, what it considers its primary uh, area of priority of operations, which is the Indian Ocean region. And there, ensuring maritime security is a priority for India. We've already seen kind of India engage um, in ensuring maritime security uh, recently, or not so recently anymore, but for example, through evacuation operations from Yemen, uh, through HADR, uh, humanitarian assistance and disaster relief operations. Most recently, we saw this after the cyclone in Mozambique. Um, but India wants to enhance its capability to do these things. And one of the things, it's a few, uh, a few notes on what it is doing in the region. It's building naval capabilities, its own naval capabilities up, and extending its own Navy's reach um, through acquisitions of equipment, uh, through logistics sharing agreements and access to naval facilities all the way from kind of Oman uh, in, uh, into its west uh, to kind of uh, getting uh, access in the Western Pacific as well. Uh, through enhancing maritime domain awareness, it's setting up an information fusion center in Delhi. It's acquired a reconnaissance aircraft, maritime reconnaissance aircraft uh, from the US through white shipping agreements, uh, coastal radar systems, um, and also using kind of these coastal radar systems that it has uh, and its satellite capabilities. Um, it is conducting regular patrols now in the entire kind of Indian Ocean regions, uh, including coordinated patrols with other countries, and now it is discussing doing joint patrols with the French. Um, it is engaging in cap uh, capacity building efforts, uh, defense uh, capacity building efforts in the region, and you see this in Southeast Asia, in Indi with Indonesia and Vietnam, for example, uh, through provision of equipment, but also training. Um, it is building infrastructure in the region, though not as successfully as it would like. Uh, it's building its own infrastructure as well, enhancing, for example, a new base in the Andaman Islands in the Bay of Bengal. Um, and it is also working through regional institutions, uh, the BIMSTEC, which is the Bay of, uh, Bay of Bengal Regional Institution, but also the Indian o Ocean Regional uh, uh, Rim Association and the in Indian Ocean Naval Symposium. Finally, in all these domains, it is working with a number of like-minded partners, uh, including, but not only, uh, the Quad, which is the kind of often discussed ones. Uh, I had a section on uh, India's challenges, but I'm out of time, uh, and we can maybe come to them in Q&A. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Tavi. Another uh, set of, great set of insights. Uh, Julie, uh, please. 
Yes, good morning. Um, thank you, MLI, for having me in this panel. Um, so because this event is about troubled waters, I would like to uh, first mention the uh, troubled water in uh, the South China Sea. Um, so there have been many, many incidents, as you um, could read um, in the news, um, incidents between China and um, Asian uh, Clement states. Um, and there were, there were um, not just survey ships, uh, fishing ships, but also submarines. Um, and the situation has been very difficult for ASEAN Clement states uh, in the South China Sea. Um, and in Canada, um, Canada has also uh, had a difficult time with China as well. Um, so we can see um, a common thing here that Canada and ASEAN countries um, um, are not prepared to deal with a rising China. Um, so Vietnam needs uh, more international support um, um, on the issue of um, the South China Sea disputes, and also Canada would need more voices in the Asia Pacific for Canadian interests. Um, so now I would like to discuss how Canada can serve um, its interests um, um, as an ASEAN partner. Um, according to Global Affairs Canada, um, ASEAN is important to Canada um, because ASEAN is at the heart of Asia's regional security architecture. ASEAN represents Canada's sixth largest trading partner. And more than 23,000 students from ASEAN um, study currently in Canada. And uh, the Canada-ASEAN Free Trade Agreement um, has had exploratory discussions. And since uh, Canada has economic, political, and security interests in ASEAN, it is in the Canadian interest um, to partner with ASEAN and to become a member of the East uh, Asia Summit uh, and the ASEAN Defense Ministers Meeting Plus. It is in the Canadian interest uh, that ASEAN is a united and effective organization that promotes rules-based order and works toward a peaceful, secure, and stable region. And that would lead me to my next point on the challenges facing ASEAN and Vietnam's role as um, ASEAN chair in 2020. Uh, Vietnam's chairmanship uh, next year is themed cohesive and responsive. Cohesive means upholding solidarity and unity, increasing economic links and connectivity, deepening values and identities of ASEAN members. Now responsive means reinforcing partnerships for peace and sustainable development and improving ASEAN adaptability and efficiency by reforming institutions. ASEAN would need to solve its consensus dilemma through institutional innovations such as uh, ASEAN minus X, a mini lateral approach, and majority decision making. So now with regard to the South, uh, South China Sea disputes, ASEAN needs to address the issue of maintaining peace and security in the region, while at the same time preserve ASEAN unity and promoting consensus whenever possible. The code of conduct um, set to be completed in 2021 would need to be negotiated rather than settle in the face of Chinese economic and military pressure. Um, so news sources uh, indicate that uh, Vietnam is considering legal action against China to resolve the contested claims in the South China Sea, although diplomatic measures are still the preferred option. And now I would like to discuss um, the ASEAN outlook on the Indo-Pacific in the context of the South China Sea disputes. Um, the outlook was adopted in June um, and continues to emphasize ASEAN's open and inclusive perspective, focusing on dialogue and cooperation that centers on economic integration and connectivity with a development-oriented approach. 
The outlook is a message from ASEAN to the world that ASEAN wants an Indo-Pacific that is peaceful, secure, stable, and prosperous. It is necessary to recall that besides adopting the ASEAN outlook on uh, the Indo-Pacific in June, ASEAN also adopted three other documents, uh, including the Vision Statement on Partnership for Sustainability, uh, Declaration on Combating Marine Debris, and Statement on the ASEAN Cultural Year. So the fact that ASEAN leaders could agree on these four documents confirmed the ability of ASEAN to cooperate, to reach consensus and unite uh, in face of challenges. It is also necessary to note that the concept of inclusive development in the ASEAN outlook signifies that China is welcome to be part of the regional partnership and the US would need to recognize that. So this outlook is not an agreement uh, nor a strategy. It is not a binding document but a guidance for ASEAN cooperation with other partners. It confirms ASEAN's responsiveness facing competing interests in the Indo-Pacific region. Um, so to conclude, um, as ASEAN chair in 2020, Vietnam will have to guide ASEAN in maintaining its centrality, being cohesive while at the same time being responsive to the current challenges. Vietnam is a proponent of peaceful and room-based dispute resolution. Again, it is uh, in Canada's interest to support ASEAN um, to be an effective organization and to promote the rule of law and maintain peace, security, and prosperity in the Indo-Pacific region. Thank you. Oh, thanks a lot. Uh, thanks a lot, Julie. Uh, Jim, uh, take us home. Thank you, Jonathan. First, let me congratulate uh, Dr. Crowley and the MLI for a splendid program. And I'm not speaking just with respect to this morning, but to the larger endeavor. I have a Mexican friend who says that every Canadian is individually hand-wrapped in cotton batten, blissfully insulated from the stern realities of the world. And MLI has come to our rescue. This sort of dialogue this morning is absolutely, utterly essential. The world, self-evidently, is becoming more and more complex and challenging, and it behooves us as Canadians living in the luxurious space that we inhabit uh, to inform ourselves about the challenges in, in this particular instance, the Indo-Pacific world. When I took off from Victoria yesterday, uh, stretched behind me for 5,000 miles was the vastness of the Pacific Ocean. And this is, I would suggest, ladies and gentlemen, the quintessential maritime era and the quintessential maritime arena, the Indo-Pacific. Two vast and distinct oceanic complexes, but inextricably linked uh, by commerce, by politics, and by geostrategic considerations. Where are we now in terms of what is happening in the maritime realm in the Indo-Pacific? I would suggest, ladies and gentlemen, that over the past half decade or more, there has been a profound and deeply disturbing change in the outward nature of the Chinese regime. That it is increasingly repressive internally, increasingly aggressive externally. And this has very distinct and disturbing maritime overtones because what we've witnessed in our lifetimes are two profound interlocking revolutions. The Chinese have embarked on two enormous ahistoric endeavors, completely revolutionary in nature. Firstly, they've discovered the sea. It was never part of the deep psyche of the Middle Kingdom before. They are, in fact, embracing the Mahanian vision that great nations have great navies. And further, they are reaching out beyond the bounds of the Middle Kingdom with their Belt and Road. And the Belt and Road, with 
a trillion dollars of investment in dozens of countries has an enormous array of deep geostrategic considerations. One has only to look at the way in which the Chinese are currently penetrating Oceania, the Pacific Islands, to see the alarm that that's causing in Washington, Wellington, and Canberra in terms of the larger geostrategic balance. And we've also already been introduced to the profound changes which have occurred in the Southeast Asian region. I would suggest, as the earlier speakers have done, that that raises a deeply troubling concern for us, not just in the maritime realm, but more broadly speaking, and that is how do you deal with a great nation which in fact addresses international law in an a la carte fashion? What interests them in this region, they accept. What doesn't interest them in another region, they deny. This is a matter of enormous consequence, as suggested. And further, I would suggest as a sidebar that I am deeply, deeply concerned about the future integrity of ASEAN. I think that the ASEAN experiment is in deep danger. But let me come back to China's discovery of the world's oceans, something that it had never done in its entire history. Because what we've seen in the past third of a century is the world's largest navy appear in the Western Pacific. Stop and think about that, ladies and gentlemen. The world's largest navy has appeared in the past 35 years in the Western Pacific. Now, I'm speaking numerically, not qualitatively, over and against the United States Navy. But if you go back to 1986, the United States Navy was striving to reach a 600-vessel threshold. It's now at 273 or 274 ships. The Royal Navy, when I served as a navigator long ago and far away in the RN, it had 152 frigates and destroyers. It now has 19. So we've seen the world's greatest navies cut in two as a result of budgetary disarmament, more than cut in two in the case of the Royal Navy. And what we've seen is the world's largest navy appear. While we've been asleep at the switch, thinking that, oh, it would never quite happen. It has happened. This has profoundly altered the naval balance. And what it means is that the great nation of the United States, which has projected and maintained and sustained its interests globally by virtue of maritime power, is now, one would say, on a collision course with the People's Liberation Army Navy. And as appropriately highlighted, not only the PLAN, the People's Liberation Army Navy, but also the Coast Guard, the world's largest Coast Guard, the Chinese Coast Guard, and the maritime militia. So what we've seen is that there has been a profound change in tone in Washington and in other cap capitals around the world. Deep concern about Chinese influence operations rather than engagement. Now policy analysts are wrestling with the problem of decoupling from China as illustrated by trade tensions between the capitals. There is, I would suggest to you, mounting anxiety about the perceived inadequacy of the United States Navy and particularly about the mounting number of missiles in the Chinese arsenal, which will make clashes at sea particularly sanguine, particularly dangerous and deadly. Now, as suggested, what there have been is a series of new arrangements relationships, alignments, and so on, in many cases led by Japan. And Japan is to be applauded for taking the lead uh, in the Western Pacific in a period of political uncertainty. But one of the critical issues is would the center hold in the event of outright hostilities? Would the Japanese, the Australians, the Indians, the Canadians work together with the US in any sort of maritime endeavor? What happens as we move forward uh, with respect to the future of Taiwan. What is to be our position? We have a highly professional Navy, but it is, at, it is at full stretch, and the Naval leadership is fully apprised of the importance of operating in the Western Pacific. The challenges are enormous. The wear and tear, as suggested in the photograph behind me, of uh, operating in heavy seas, this is one which Navalists have to deal with on a daily basis. Our acquisition programs have been, unfortunately, 
attenuated. We're building great ships, but uh, we see that in the Chinese context between 19, or 2015 and 2019, they built and commissioned over 80 warships. In the first eight months of last year, the Chinese commissioned 19 warships. Think about it, 19 warships. That's almost effectively the Canadian Navy in the first eight months of last year. So what I'm suggesting, ladies and gentlemen, is that the international landscape is becoming more and more challenging. We have been, in effect, asleep at the switch. One can argue, of course, that there are other issues in the North Atlantic, in the Mediterranean and beyond, which have deflected our attention. But there is an entirely new maritime uh, reality emerging in the Western Pacific. And this is one that we've got to reflect upon seriously. Articulate policy which relates to those challenges and in fact work together because in my estimation, and I was saying this to an audience in Canberra in Australia just the other day, that if we don't work together, we hang separately. This is a period in which we have to put a premium on alliance building and realistic maritime endeavor to maintain law and order at sea and international good order. Many thanks. Well, uh, thanks, thanks, Jim. Um, you you are right that we are in this uh, age of disruption, and uh, I'm you know happy that this isn't an international trade event. I was just in the U.S. earlier this month um, uh, on a, a Asia uh, conference circuit, and uh, we were talking about the Trans-Pacific Partnership and the U.S. withdrawing from that, and. And I think uh, part of the jokes in Washington was that if we rebrand this, the Trump-Pence partnership, uh, maybe uh, we could get the, the U.S. to kind of get back in. But uh, I think you bring up a good point. I think this will kind of come back. Now we're going to begin the moderated discussion. Uh, how do we wave through some of the noise when we're in this period of disruption and really understand the importance and the critical nature of what we're talking about in the Indo-Pacific? It's not to uh, downplay the importance of what's happening in Syria or um, the very severe strains that are happening now in the relationship with NATO. Um, uh, but how do we really focus the attention on, on what really, in my mind, is the critical issue uh, that we should be focusing on in the coming years? Um, so uh, how this is going to work for this uh, part of the, the program is I'm, I'm just going to send a few uh, questions to you guys. I'm going to prompt all of you individually, but these are non-exclusive questions. I, you know, it's a feel free to jump in. It's a jump ball type of uh, um, policy. Um, and uh, so we'll, we'll start with one round and kind of see where we're going for time. And uh, again, we'll try to get uh, open it up to the audience at about 11.45 and, uh, and have some uh, questions from you. Um, so a lot to chew on here, a lot to unpack. Uh, uh, one of the, the first kind of questions, and Greg, this is uh, more towards you, uh, but uh, I think, again, others can, can chime into this. Um, just prior to this conference, I think it would have been a, 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 maybe yesterday or the day before, uh, I had heard reports um, uh, from the U.S.-South Korea side about uh, U.S. burden sharing and uh, obviously the very unrealistic asks that the U.S. is imposing on South Korea. We're seeing very similar things. I think potentially this is going to be a, maybe a, an upcoming nightmare for Japan. And the, the way I dovetail this back into the maritime security in your discussion of the Indo-Pacific strategy is how can that be managed or can that be managed, these very um, unrealistic burden sharing uh, demands with allies? Uh, I think as you quite clearly noted, if the U.S. is going to pursue an Indo-Pacific strategy that's going to be successful, uh, the backbone of that is with its, uh, with its key allies and partners. Um, so if you can kind of touch on that, uh, that would be great. Um, and the second kind of a bit more of a technical question for you, Greg, on uh, the gray zone challenges, which I think you, you highlighted very well in some of the tactics China's using in the South China Sea and, and frankly is using other, in other places in East China Sea as well um, with the maritime militia. What, is a, what are the solutions or the uh, approaches that the U.S. and its allies can kind of, uh, um, I know we're doing lots of things, capacity building, other elements, but what are, the, what are some of the um, recommendations to try to mitigate some of those gray zone challenges in the maritime domain? Um, second, uh, for uh, Hikutani-sensei, um, again, following up a little bit on the gray zone and a bit more on the, the East China Sea. So I think we had a lot of discussion uh, this morning on the South China Sea, with a, which I do think is very critical, but um, there also is a, is a considerable uh, maritime assertiveness by China through its maritime militia in the East China Sea around Japan's Senkaku Islands. So if you could just give us a little bit of an update on uh, the situation there. 
Um, again, I think coming back to Jim's point on this age of disruption, um, one of the things that I think about um, uh, the East China Sea when I talk to folks who are even quite knowledgeable about the region, they, they tend to think, well, I haven't heard much about that recently. You know, I see North Korea in the news, South China Sea from time to time. That dispute with China, that's, things are okay, right? That's generally, um, and then I tend to show them the map of, uh, that the Japanese Coast Guard puts out of the incursions of, uh, of Chinese vessels uh, and also on the, uh, the um, overflight as well. And fundamentally, what I would tell audiences is nothing really has changed. I mean, in, in many ways, I think Chinese, China's diversified. There has been ebbs and flows of, on the numbers of incursions. But um, uh, if you could kind of touch on, on that situation in a little bit more detail, that would be uh, great. Uh, Tanvi, uh, on the quad, I mean, I think this is another kind of buzzword, and I think you referenced it quite a bit, and uh, obviously it's resuscitated itself for the second time. Um, I wonder if you could kind of dig a bit into more, um, not so much on, you know, will the, where will the quad be in two or three years, or will it still be in its same form, but is there space for others within the quad, or, or, or does it not make sense in that sort of alignment? Does it, you know, as you referenced, India has a lot of other webs of trilaterals, uh, whether it's India, Japan, Australia, India, US, Japan. Uh, there's a lot of other uh, alignments and, and mechanisms that India is involved in. And I guess my question there is more leaning towards potentially Canada. Is there any sort of role, potentially not in the quad, but other way that Canada could be involved um, with India in that respect? Um, Julie, uh, again, thanks, especially on the ASEAN's outlook for the Indo-Pacific, I think that was very interesting. My kind of question, I guess more, um, and I guess it's more of a comment and want to hear your insights on your point on the East Asia Summit and the ADM Plus, which I think, um, you know, anyone who's, who's uh, been exposed to conferences on Canada and Asia and, and, and Canada and the Indo-Pacific, has heard that this this point that uh, that we do have a desire to get into both clubs, I, I do think it's a laudable goal. Um, my worry has been that for too long we've focused on that as the goal, the the only goal. Uh, it's been the kind of the big shiny um, uh, thing to cling to um, to to get into both of those clubs. I wonder what has been the cost of that, and whether you feel like it's 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 still important to kind of f pursue that but also to nurture those bilateral relationships underneath that. Um, so kind of the balance that Canada maybe should have when it looks to getting into those clubs, but also doing the efforts, the FaceTime, uh, and, and actually um, uh, what you're doing uh, in, at post uh, uh, to, uh, to maybe uh, deserve to get into those clubs. Um, and, uh, and, and second, uh, uh, the last uh, comment uh, for Jim, um, I think, as far as some of the Canadian efforts, especially in the last few years, I mean, I think some of the best stories actually have been coming from the defense side. I know, as you said, um, in resource terms, uh, the Navy's constrained. Um, but if I think of even some of the agreements, whether it's um, the uh, cross-servicing and logistics agreement with Japan, uh, the port visits, obviously, of the ships, HMCS Ottawa, the Chikuni-class submarines, um, yeah, there's a lot of things happening. But how is how are all those individual things going to be binded together? And I think this kind of I lay the, the most difficult question on you, but I think this is um, one of the elephants in the room for those who are focused on Asia Pacific, Indo Pacific. Is this strategy? Uh, how do we bind together some of those positive things that Canada has been doing on the defense security side, uh, which need to be married, obviously, on the diplomatic side and the trade side? Um, but how do you see that um, sort of kind of binding together and selling what we've been doing and obviously trying to do a bit more. Uh, but how, how can we do that in the coming years as we try to develop a, an Indo-Pacific uh, strategy? Yeah, yeah, Greg, please. All right. Um, <clears throat> uh, so the burden sharing discussion is, is difficult because as I said, it, you cannot pursue the Indo-Pacific strategy, the freedom of the Pacific. You can't pursue any effective Asia strategy if you're the United States or Canada or anybody else in solitude. Um, aside from the fact that U.S. presence has undergirded stability in the region since the end of the Second World War, as Jim adequately pointed out, the U.S., on many metrics, not all, but on in a worrying number of metrics, is at parity or falling behind the Chinese. That is not true if you talk about the U.S. and allies. Uh, but in isolation, the U.S. is not winning this foot race uh, on, on any metric you look at. To date, 
uh, you have seen the Pentagon, the military, the uh, lawmakers on Capitol Hill serving as a backstop to the Trump administration's isolationist policy on this. Uh, last year, South Korea's, uh, the amount of funding South Korea gave to, to support U.S. presence in South Korea increased 8%. Um, the Trump administration had, I, I believe, demanded that they double it. So uh, clearly there's lots of room to negotiate from these insane demands. But as you pointed out, the demands made this month have been particularly insane. The U.S. is demanding a uh, basic quintupling of the funding from South Korea and roughly a tripling of the funding from Japan. I don't know what we're supposed to do with that. Gold plate all the cutlery in the mess halls. It's a ridiculous amount of money. I mean, uh, uh, not only does it undermine our strategy, of course, it is far more expensive to base those forces in the United States than it is to base them in Japan and Korea. And they can't do the only mission they have, which is in theater. The, the one silver lining here, of course, is that I, I discourage both American and foreign audiences from looking at what goes on in the current White House as indicative of broader shifts in U.S. strategic thinking. So aside from what policy wonks think, which is, of course, still very pro-alliance, when you look at public polling, uh, support for U.S. alliances in Asia among the American public is higher than it's been in decades. Roughly two-thirds of Americans not only support the Japanese and Korean alliances, but respond that we should be willing to fight a war with China in defense of those allies. That is higher than it's ever been, uh, with that question being asked. That said, American voters, like Canadian voters, or every other voters, they tend not to vote on foreign policy. So I guess all I can say is this is not indicative of what most Americans think. However, that does not necessarily mean that they're going to throw the bums out because of concerns about alliance management. On maybe a more comfortable note, the South China Sea. I mean, look, the, you know, the, the South China Sea is not lost uh, despite those headlines popping up. If by lost you mean is China in control of all activity in the South China Sea? Not yet. Has anybody accepted the validity of Chinese claims? Not yet. Um, but we are certainly losing, and I mean we as an international community. The China has hit on a strategy that is working. This gray zone coercion combined with its, what, what people refer to as lawfare, the kind of purposeful twisting and use of selective pieces of international law as it suits China's purposes, this is working because we don't have a toolkit to respond to it. Right? The US Navy has rules of engagement for what to do if they're harassed by the PLA Navy. They don't have any rules of engagement for what to do if harassed by armed fishermen or foreign coast guards. Uh, what exactly are we supposed to do to protect Filipino fishing rights in the Philippine EZ? You're not gonna go out and fight a war over every Filipino fishing boat. What are you supposed to do to protect Vietnamese oil and gas operations? The answer is the solutions are all non-military. There is a military component here that is absolutely necessary. You do need to do presence operations and freedom navigation operations to signal resolve and to under to, to underline the illegal nature of Chinese claims. You have to do capacity building and joint trainings to help bolster the maritime security, maritime domain awareness capabilities of partners. But all of that is at best treading water. None of that is gonna reverse Chinese claims. None of that's gonna convince China to modify its behavior. For that, you need concerted international diplomatic and economic pressure. And the biggest problem we've had over the last three years is that South China Sea has tumbled from the top of the diplomatic agenda. At the end of the Obama administration, it was South China Sea number one at every Asian forum. Now it's probably somewhere around five or six below North Korea and whatever trade fight we're picking that week and nine other things. And that means that China is getting away scot-free. It does not suffer in the reputational damage it must to decide that its global interests are better served by seeking a compromise with its smaller neighbors. The other thing we should be looking at is economic leverage. It is absurd to me, frankly cowardly to me, that we have no problem sanctioning Russian companies and Russian military officers for supporting paramilitaries in eastern Ukraine. We have no problem sanctioning Chinese companies who smuggled North Korea. We can't even have a debate about sanctioning Chinese companies who are intentionally ramming and sinking Filipino fishing boats or creating illegal threats of collision to Vietnamese lawful activity in its own EZ. This is, of course, something that we should be doing. These companies should, at the very least, 
companies that are engaging in illegal island building and military construction and harassment in the South China Sea should not be allowed to invest in U.S. and Canadian and Australian ports and infrastructure, which they are freely. So that's the two places I, I would start. Yeah, no, very good comments. And I mean, I think the other large uh, vacuum that I think is, is on leadership, I mean, I think of even the East Asia Summit and these meetings where we used to be held at the highest level. Um, but now the uh, the um, the level that was sent at I forget what was it but Wilbur Ross was uh, a uh, and, and commerce secretary were sent so on the on the uh, d disruption and burden sharing we may have you back next November after the election <laughs> depending on the result um, Jim uh, thank you Jonathan perhaps I could just add a quick uh, footnote uh, the Chinese have the world's largest fishing fleet quite how large it is remains to be seen perhaps. 300,000, perhaps 400,000 ships. Uh, the Chinese in recent years have selected a small number which they have militarized and they've provided special training for the crews, special communications equipment, uh, small arms and so forth and these constitute the maritime militia to which Greg was referring. And for the longest time, it strikes me that Western navies were in a state of paralysis as to how to respond to these uh, armed fishing vessels on the grounds that, well, surely they must be civilian vessels, so we can't really take any firm action against them. I believe I'm right, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, Greg, that your uh, recent chief of uh, naval operations uh, did finally make a determination that in terms of encounters where sh U.S. naval vessels were threatened with ramming or obstruction, that uh, the United States Navy would treat uh, fishing vessels in this case as if they were uh, foreign combatants. For the longest time, the Chinese exploited the ambiguity and uncertainty in our minds as to quite how to apply uh, maritime law to what would in every other context be basically a civilian vessel, but now they're seen as warships. Yeah, please. So I mean, that's right. We've seen this from the Assistant Secretary of Defense and from the CNO recently, um, not necessarily specifically calling out the militia, but saying that we don't care what color the hull is painted. A Chinese vessel creating a risk to the livelihood or life of, of, of American mariners will be treated as an armed combatant. The problem is we are going to take every step to avoid that on the water, which means if a Chinese maritime militia vessel tries to ram a U.S. Navy ship, the U.S. Navy ship is going to veer off course in, you know, keeping with coal regs, but that also sends a message that China's strategy can work because China is willing to accept a level of risk that the rest of the international community would consider insane. Um, which is exactly what they're doing toward their neighbors. The other problem is that we have not yet decided if activities by Chinese civilians, whether they are Coast Guard or maritime militia, if they rise to the level of U.S. intervention under our alliances. And so this is the real problem undergirding current tension with Manila, where you have the Defense Secretary talking about, yes, we understand that if the Chinese Navy bombs our facility on Tito Island, you will respond. We've never really questioned that. The question is, what are you going to do when Filipino fishers are being routinely rammed and sunk by Chinese fishing vessels. And the U.S. does not have an answer for that. Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, thank you. I think this gray zone coercion challenge is, uh, is, is fundamental. And, um, you know, it's not your grandfather's Coast Guard and it's not your grandfather's fishing vessels. So I think uh, this is the Chinese uh, example here clearly highlights that point and uh, trying to find a, an adequate response for that. Uh, Hikotani Sensei, do you mind uh, telling us a little bit uh, on that note? Um, a little bit of an update on uh, the, the Senkaku issue and how Japan is trying to deal with that? Um, I think I spoke pretty extensively about how Japan is trying to deal with that um, in terms of what the defense force can or might be able to do. Um, but in terms of just to um, add a little bit more on what the situation is, I mentioned the number of Coast Guard ships increasing, but it's not just the number of Coast Guard ships increasing, but also now, um, Greg, you're, you're an expert on this, that you, you would be able to explain the implications of that more than me, but the Chinese Coast Guard being under the command of People's Armed Police since July 2018, um, does that have an impact on the type of operations that might place? Um, the other is that there's more growing A2A or anti-access area denial capabilities that make the southwestern islands of Japan more vulnerable. So it's not really 
just about the Sekaku and the, what we talked about in terms of Coast Guard and fishing ships, but there's more fear about that area of being a concern for Japan that is leading to more emphasis investment or exploration of amphibious capabilities in the Japanese forces, including um, aircraft launch cruise missiles and subs near the main islands of Japan, not just the Senkaku, but something that can reach that area. Also, um, the other thing is that there has been um, concerns about the underwater resource development in the East China Sea area. There was an attempt for an agreement in 2008 about joint cooperation on underwater development, but um, the Chinese side has not been honoring or trying to move forward with the cooperation. Instead, they have been unilaterally creating or starting 12 new platforms underwater closer and closer to Japan than it was before. So those are the areas of concern. Um, one more um, technological thing that um, uh, investment that concerns Japan is the unmanned systems that Chinese is seem to be very much um, accelerating its development and that together it's not just about the Senkaku I think, but that region is becoming more of a concern for Japan also in the mainland as well. Yeah, I mean, thank you for also highlighting the resource uh, issue in the East China Sea, because I think that's an important one too. Just a quick uh, follow-up on that, and less from the technical defense side, but more from the geopolitical side. You. You referenced uh, Xi Jinping uh, enjoying the the, the uh, hanami, or the he's going to maybe he'll have a hanami with uh, Prime Minister Abe under the cherry blossom trees in the in the spring. Um, it's a significant visit. Do you think, with this kind of, uh, while I myself am a bit uh, skeptical about how how far this relationship is is thawing, um, there there has been improvement on the on the on the high level. Uh, leader side. Do you think that there is going to be anything coming out of this summit that, uh, whether it's related to the East China Sea, do you think there's going to be any sort of improvement in that relationship, or do you think it's just going to be a lot of wallpaper? Um, um, I'm really not an expert on China, but um, I do think that there is the sense that this has to happen, which is leading to some maybe possible cooperation. There was one case, so there's good news and bad news about it, but there was a Hokkaido University professor that was um, arrested um, in Beijing after being invited by the Chinese uh, Council of Social Science. So he was um, for accusations that he was um, he had obtained secret material. His, he's a historian, so he had material about the China Sino-Japanese War. So it was more historical, but there was claims, and he was gone or he was missing for two weeks. But now he has returned, and I think the reason why that happened is that there was the um, the Japanese government took the opportunity of meetings that are taking place that to say that if this doesn't get solved, it is gonna hurt the cherry blossom viewing between the two <laughs> leaders. How much of that you can capitalize on that happening, I am not too sure. But one thing that I like to um, underline is that um, I don't, like whenever I show the map of Japan to um, the class that I teach on US policy with East Asia, Japan looks utterly lonely in the Pacific. And that there's reasons why we can't, we say we can't move out of the region. We're not gonna be able to move the Japanese archipelago somewhere else. So there are reasons why we, we need a, a level of confidence. And that one thing that is, has been missing or has progressed is the confidence building measures between Japan and China. So things like that, I do hope there will be some progress, but I'm not too sure if the um, having a, something happening up leading to something um, positive, especially once this happens. I'm not too sure, but I think there might be some joint concern about the United States going forward, and there might be some pragmatic response. I hope to be hopeful, but I, I'm kind of skeptical to ask how much that can accomplish. Oh, great. Um, well, thank you. Uh, Tanvi, if you don't, quad, I'm sure, one of your favorite topics that you get asked a lot about, so if you could uh, please just uh, tell us a little bit more about that. Well, it's related to actually this point about kind of Japan and China, but also um, this idea of Kind of, if we don't work together, we I really like that um, line that if we don't work together, we'll hang separately. There is a collective action problem that we've seen in the region, not just with the Quad countries, but kind of like-minded partners more broadly, and which China has taken advantage of. And one of the reasons for that collective action problem, not just the general um, reasons that we've seen before in kind of alliances and partnerships, but also because of the nature of each of the major powers' engagements with China. And I think one of the and, the, and the fact that everybody is connected to them economically particularly, and uh, for many of the countries, they can't escape geography, so they have to deal with China. And it is this, I think, where countries, ha they're constantly questioning each other's reliability. Every time one of the country's major powers in the region 
has an engagement with China, the others start questioning whether they are you know, going weak in the knees and, or, and are they going to be resilient. And I think that's where, when these meetings and summits are watched, people have to make a, dis a d distinction between is, there, is this bringing about, is this about changing the tone and temperature? Or is it about substance changing? And often it is the first, not the second. And so this panic that kind of ensues uh, doesn't really help kind of that collective um, uh, action uh, uh, in the region. Um, going back to the Quad, I think you know one thing to keep in mind is in terms of how others can engage uh, or come in, which is that is, this is not an Asian NATO, as Beijing likes to say. It's not an alliance. There's no secret handshake. Um, what it is and how I see it is it's a cap coalition of the capable and willing. And the reason I say is willing is these countries will work together with whoever is willing to work with kind of this partnership um, that is also willing to take on any blowback from China. Because usually there's concern that you know China might not like those countries hanging out with, uh, um, with each other. And so I think it's important to kind of keep that in mind. Um, we have already kind of, we, we've seen these countries do certain things together, Australia, India, Japan, the US. Um, they meet diplomatically now, uh, both not just at the official working level, but at the ministerial level. Uh, they are about to, if not actually doing right now, a counterterrorism exercise. Um, but they're also talking about a range of issues with each other that aren't just about kind of maritime security, though that's actually a key focus. Um, they're talking about things like regional connectivity, um, uh, technology, um, investment screening, um, talking about kind of influence operations, talking about cybersecurity. And that's where even if countries don't necessarily have the naval capabilities, can actually play a role. I mean, Japan's a good example. Uh, Japan doesn't necessarily do as much as the others in terms of the defense side. But they are the ones taking the lead in the region on uh, kind of having a regional connectivity strategy that, frankly, the others don't quite have in any kind of similar degree. So I don't. I think the Quad has come to the conclusion that everybody doesn't have to do everything everywhere and doesn't have to do it all at once together. Um, each one has a different area of geographic um, priority and a different, sometimes different strengths, comparative advantages in terms of functional areas. And I think for, for Canada, a couple of things to kind of consider is these countries are, yes, there's quad cooperation, uh, but there's also these countries working with the, within that level with each other bilaterally, trilaterally, but also bringing in others. So I'll give you two examples. Um, one is, for example, US, the US, India, Japan, and the Philippines did a group sale through the South China Sea recently. Part of that was to uh, assuage ASEAN concerns that they were kind of being left out of the, the kind of uh, region. Uh, but it was also to show that they're willing to work with others. Uh, another example, Australia, uh, the US, Japan, uh, and led by, did a uh, naval exercise in the Bay of Bengal with France, uh, La Perouse. Uh, this past year, um, another instance, and would have been done with kind of Indian acquiescence because it is in kind of India's uh, general neighborhood, um, and so there are ways to even on the maritime security side, uh, you know, plug into this uh, to this uh, network, and it doesn't have to be uh, just these countries uh, doing things together. I think they're very open to partners, but often partners have been hesitant because of concerns about uh, what the, the Chinese might. In terms of actually expanding the Quad per se, I think uh, Prime Minister Abe wanted to. He used to talk about UK and France. Uh, but at some point, if you expand it too much, I think you will dilute the effectiveness that they do have at the moment. Yeah, I think, I mean, the, it's a great point on the atmospherics versus the tangible uh, things that are actually could be done by the Quad. And I think for for too long, there was so much of a focus on the atmospheric. So can we get the foreign ministers, which we now have together, but can we get the leaders together? Can we have all these photo ops? That's important, but actually the, the, the real uh, grit of what should be done is whether it's sharing on capacity building, whether it's working at that working level. So I think my sense, again, is that probably where the quad is going right now is actually probably a positive direction, because I think it's going to that detailed level. It's going to that working level and focusing less on necessarily having the photo ops or publicizing the, the meetings as, uh, as much. So thank you. Uh, Just on that, I mean, a, a good example of this, for example, is when we talked about connectivity. Every Belt and Road project isn't bad. 
infrastructure, if just because a Chinese company is building infrastructure, that's not bad. What, for example, the four countries can and to some extent are talking about is where, which are the projects that do have strategic implications and that they need to either alone or together or with others actually offer a viable alternative for? Yes, please. Um, just to add on, I, I like the concept of the coalition of the capable and willing and not to be too stuck on whether what the quad is supposed to be based on some implicit assumption that there's like a NATO model or some kind of model. Um, and just to add to that, um, in terms of joint exercises, um, when coming to this event, I um, did a, I tried to study for this event by talking to my former student from the Defense Academy who's studying at Columbia right now. And I saw this myriad list of joint exercising taking place. And I asked them, what's the difference between those and the type of meetings that take place among the defense ministers? Because I from a non-expert point of view, it looks really nice because there's different ships from different, um, with different flags. But he said from a lieutenant commander's point of view that these things really matter because it leads to interoperability. And so in a way, the North Korean ship to ship transfer patrol mission, although it's the cause of it is unfortunate, it is sort of a good opportunity for countries to actually work together on something, not too much bound by the quad or whatever the diplomatic level, but at the working level on doing something together. So to prepare for working together when something does happen. So just to add to that. Uh, yes, I just wanted to make a quick point that there's another element of the maritime realm that we need to bear very much in mind. And it was alluded to a moment ago with the Belt and Road that a number of the key Belt and Road initiatives that China is fostering around the world relate to ports. Hambantota in Sri Lanka, Gwadar in Pakistan. Farther afield, a major Chinese offensive into the weak economic underbelly of Europe, whether it's Piraeus in Greece and so forth, so that there's a critical element of China's larger global strategy, and that's to gain operational control of ports, whether Darwin in northwestern Australia, whether it's ports in the East African coast, and so forth. And so you would be fascinated and perhaps alarmed to see the degree to which Chinese-related port management firms now control the operations of major ports around the world. So, uh, and in fact, just recently, I think, uh, when it came to LA Long Beach in California, uh, they, uh, the authorities, in fact, terminated uh, the relationship with the Chinese management facility. But that's another part of the larger maritime strategy that uh, buttresses China's national interests and comes within the context of Belt and Road Initiatives. That's great. I do want to give you and uh, Julie a chance to uh, to answer that last question. I think we'll stick with this one round. Just to, I do want to get this uh, to the audience as well. But one thing that I think brought, got brought up, I think, Jim, you brought this up, and I think this is uh, an important point that we haven't really discussed too much. Number one is Taiwan. I think I'd like to get you know some the, um, the panel's uh, perspectives on where Taiwan might fit in in this Indo-Pacific discussion. Uh, but the second end is that we looked at the maps at the beginning stages, and as I said, everyone's got a definition of the Indo-Pacific. But what we tend to usually be focusing on, and it's somewhat understandable, is whether it's the South China Sea or the Indian Ocean region or the East China Sea. But how about the ends, the Pacific Islands, uh, and on the other end, Africa? Uh, where do they fit in when we're talking about this Indo-Pacific concept? Uh, how should we be prioritizing that? So that's our general kind of questions. I mean, you can mull on that um, um, as uh, during the question time too. So um, first, Julie and Jim, um, I'll give you a little bit of time and um, if anybody else wants to chime in on, on the other questions. Yes, um, with regard to uh, Canada's uh, possible and potential membership, um, uh, for the East Asia Summit and the uh, ASEAN uh, Defense uh, Ministers meeting. Um, I think that there's, uh, there's been a lot of confusion uh, around this, uh, probably because um, uh, we, we are not sure where to start. Um, should Canada start by presenting what Canada can bring to the table first before the, um, the group? decide to uh, provide membership to Canada? Because so far we haven't, ASEAN have not heard yet uh, about Canada's intention. Um, and uh, my take on this is that ASEAN understands what Canada can offer 
even more than Canada understand themselves. So for that reason, there's some kind of confusion um, and uh, there's enthusiasm from ASEAN to invite Canada to be a member, but uh, probably what we need is um, a bigger effort uh, from Canada to show interest and to start showing what Canada can bring to the table um, to these um, two groups. And uh, on the bigger, on, on the bigger um, topic of Canada-ASEAN relations, um, I, I think that um, there needs to be um, a better understanding from both sides in terms of um, um, what our needs are and what we can do for the other partner. Um, so, so far, when Canada um, goes to ASEAN, it's just about trade and education. Um, but the reality of ASEAN is a lot more than trade and education. Uh, there's issues about security, about ensuring peace um, in the region. So if Canada just talk about trade and education, it's, uh, it, it's not about what, what ASEAN is concerning the most right now. Um, and uh, next year, for instance, um, the theme of ASEAN is cohesive and, and, and responsive. So what Canada can do to ensure uh, that cohesiveness and also responsiveness for ASEAN, then that would be a really big value that Canada could add to ASEAN. And Canada could start with statements to support ASEAN. Um, so for example, with the, uh, the arbitration between China and the Philippines, uh, it took Canada, I believe, more than a week to provide a statement um, about that to support the rule of law. Um, so um, I, I think Canada can start with that, uh, the statements, and then um, show more of what Canada can bring to the table. Thank you. I, I think Julie's absolutely right. A big part of what all outside parties here, including Canada and the Europeans, play is kind of the normative role, right? Making it clear that the way China wants to do business is not okay, that it is not universally accepted. And the South China Sea is a key part of this. I would say it took Canada a week. It took the Filipinos over three months to, <laughs> to issue a statement supportive of their own ruling. So Canada's doing pretty well. Today, there are eight countries in the world that have publicly gone on the record calling for Chinese compliance with the ruling. And Canada is one of those. So one out of eight is not bad. Uh, before the ruling, there were 56. And so we should be asking hard questions of, for instance, the French, the Germans, all the other states who had gone on the record and then got very, very quiet after the Chinese lost. What happened to their backbone? And I think what Greg is alluding to by indirection in a way is a critical issue, a critical phenomenon that we need to bear in mind, and that's hedging. That virtually all of the major powers and minor powers in the arena that we've been exploring this morning have China as their number one trade partner, but look to the United States as their principal security guarantor. So if you look at Australia, for example, you see the Australians are overwhelmingly committed through uh, coal exports, iron ore exports, and other exports to China. Uh, but the relationship between Canberra uh, and Beijing is strained in the security realm, and Canberra looks to Washington. So when we see uncertainty and havering on the part of various capitals around the region, in many cases, it's raw economic leverage that's being applied. Uh, for example, when the South Koreans wanted to put in a missile system over and against the North Korean threat, uh, the Chinese immediately cut off almost all their tourists to South Korea and effectively bankrupted the Lotte department store chain from South Korea operating in China. When it was the case of the Philippines, suddenly, for agricultural reasons, uh, Philippines bananas couldn't go into to, uh, China. And we're, of course, being subject to the same strong-armed mafiosi tactics uh, with some of our agricultural products uh, as a result of the whole Madame Meng standoff. Uh, 
But coming back to your issue, uh, I'm, I appreciate we're, I'm running over, and I'm, I'm contributing to us running over, uh, but the whole question of Canada and the region. Um, I think that in defense of foreign affairs, uh, throughout much of the first Trudeau administration, uh, foreign affairs was being eaten alive by the whole question of free trade. So I think we can give them a pass to some degree on that re in, in that respect. But uh, I think that broadly speaking, there's been a deep cultural reluctance to come to grips with the hard questions in Ottawa in terms of foreign policy. There is no foreign affairs blueprint. And so how are you going to proceed as a defense ministry, for example, in articulating a defense structure when you've got no larger context in which to locate it, to embed it? And that was a question I put to the chief of defense staff and to the minister some years ago, just across the street in the Chateau Laurier at one of the Ottawa conferences. Uh, how are you going to proceed with uh, your defense review when you've got no foreign policy review. So we have not come to grips with this issue. Taiwan I alluded to because it strikes me that in the Chinese context there's a revolutionary calendar unfolding. We're coming up to 2021, which is the 100th anniversary of the establishment of the uh, people, uh, Chinese Communist Party back in Shanghai in, in, in 1921. Uh, 2049 is the other bookend. That's the 100th anniversary of the establishment of the People's Republic of China. To what degree will Xi be under mounting pressure, and he has this overweening ambition to be one of the great trifecta in the sky of Mao, Deng, and Xi. Uh, to what degree will he be under mounting pressure to deal with the last piece of outstanding business, the reincorporation of Taiwan. And of course, as you're well aware, in January of this year, he delivered a real saber-rattling speech to Taipei. The irony, of course, is that that sort of talk, the arrogance that underpins it, and of course, Chinese actions or inactions in Hong Kong have very nearly guaranteed for the, in the short term that Madame Tsai will be re-elected in Taipei in, in January of, of, of next year. So, but this is unfinished business from the Chinese mainland's perspective. What is Canada's position? I don't know. I don't know that there's been any thought given, and I don't know to what degree there's been thought given to how we move forward in the post-Meng era. And this is a truly critical issue because in many ways the Chinese may have done us a favor by knocking us out of our naive dream world in terms of the nature of our relationship across the Pacific. The Navy, I think, is really at the forefront in terms of engagement in the region, and it comes back to the whole question of ADMM Plus, because when Peter McKay was in Southeast Asia some years ago, uh, he said, oh, Canada's really interested in joining the ADMM Plus, and they basically said, and who the hell are you? <laughs> what Ottawa's learned slowly is that you've got to be there consistently. You've got to be there over year after year after year. It's a pain in the neck to go to Southeast Asia. It's a long way from Ottawa. And people may not notice that you're there, but they'll certainly notice if you're not there. So building a relationship is a real challenge. Unfortunately, as I alluded, I think that ASEAN, uh, ironically, at the very moment of achieving community status, is now in a state of uh, f fatal fracturing uh, because a number of the key players minor players are clearly uh, in Beijing's back pocket. Okay, well, thanks, Jim. Uh, you know, I know that we're getting uh, very, we're over time for questions, but I do very quickly, uh, if you can just in 30 seconds, uh, make a point on the Pacific Islands, because I know that that's something that you work on. And we'll get to Africa and everything else uh, at the question period. Yeah, I mean, just because it hasn't really come up, it has become very much in vogue to talk about the Pacific Islands as a new front of, of competition with China all in the same way that we talk about the South China Sea and the East China Sea and Taiwan. Of course, there is a contestation going on in the Pacific Islands, mainly on the trade and investment front, but it is not at the same stakes as other disputes. If the United States and Australia and France and New Zealand lose their primacy in the Pacific Islands, they will have nobody to blame but themselves. We have and have had overwhelming dominance on both the military and economic sphere since the end of, of the Second World War. The U.S. has a U.S. state, three territories, a number of insular features like Wake Island, three freely associated states, 
The French have basing throughout the region, as do the Australians. Of course, we should smack down projects like the Black Rock Camp in Fiji or the Manus base in Papua New Guinea, which the Aussies blocked, if they are very clearly a strategic threat. But we cannot overreact. If we say that states have, that the free note in the Pacific is all about ensuring that all states have the right to make sovereign decisions, then guess what? Sometimes they're gonna make decisions we don't like. There's nothing we can do about Vanuatu allowing Chinese ships to occasionally pull in and refuel in Luganville. There's nothing we can do about Kiribati switching diplomatic recognition to Taiwan, other than compete better and make those choices seem less attractive. That's important. Well, let's, uh, and I do think this kind of loops back and links back things to Taiwan because, the, 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 as you re referenced, the picking off of uh, diplomatic allies. Uh, Jim, I, I will, uh, I really do want to get to the question period, so uh, I'll, I'll loop back to you. If you five seconds. Five seconds, uh, okay. I draw your attention, ladies and gentlemen, to an Australian broadcasting uh, production it's called 60 Minutes. It's a 22-minute documentary on the Chinese and the Pacific Islands. It just came out uh, a few days ago. Okay, uh, well, great. Uh, thank you for being uh, so patient, and uh, it's, it's your turn now, so uh, please feel free to come up to the mic. I would ask that you do please identify yourself um, before asking your question, and please do make it concise. Uh, we're going to try to group a few questions, so if, uh, if we can get three to four questions, uh, that'd be great. Uh, Jerry, if you, you want to come up, uh, that'd be great. And if, if the question is directed at one person or the panel, please reference that too. Yeah, I'll, I'll direct it at Greg Pauling. Uh, Jerry Wright from the uh, Canadian International Council and the Norman Patterson School at Carleton. Uh, I, this is a very stimulating discussion, but I find myself struggling with the, the question of what exactly is the problem here? Uh, are we really, is the problem really a long-term issue that is, is going to be characterized by neither side wishing to, to uh, back down, uh, and is it therefore, uh, and in which there is a considerable sharing of, uh, of objectives, uh, the Chinese sharing our objective in avoiding conflict, the Chinese sharing our objective in keeping a free and uh, unimpeded uh, commercial uh, pass passage for commercial activity, uh, and is the question really a moral issue of whether or not we will be able to defend the moral underpinnings of an international rules regime and the Chinese interest there, therefore being in trying to sap our energy, our initiative, our impetus, and doing so by behaving properly, by, uh, by avoiding uh, the kinds of, uh, uh, of, confl of, of, up of, of conflicts that, uh, that alarm the West. And but with the consequence that our resolve will be diminished, both in Japan and in the United States, uh, that there will be less desire or less ability to uh, make the, uh, the, uh, the fiscal effort uh, to uh, sustain a substantial uh, establishment in the Western Pacific to defend that international rules regime. Okay, thanks, uh, Jerry. Uh, Maria, please. Hi, uh, I'm uh, Maria Koketz, a student from uh, Carleton University. Uh, I just have a question about uh, India and um, just the India-China relationship. So uh, I was uh, in uh, Mumbai for two months with uh, Professor Dehejia, and uh, I just saw um, like Chinese um, telecom market expanding in India hugely. Like I saw uh, Oppo, Xiaomi, and uh, these uh, Chinese phone, phone markets uh, expanding. And I was thinking that uh, making India policy that China involves to uh, India markets, um, there, there's a um, sense of India actually growing uh, because of Chinese uh, uh, particip participants to uh, Indian growth, and uh, so like that's the kind of like uh, I'm curious about the, um, like uh, how far can India go, and uh, same time not China to actually withdraw from Indian market, um, like how far can India involve with Indian uh, in the Indo-Pacific strategies or the vision? Um, it's just uh, that's uh, my question. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Maria. Aji, please. Thank you, Jonathan. My Aji from the Embassy of Indonesia. Uh, thank you, uh, the four panelists, for the insightful comments. Um, it's always interesting to, to, to learn more about the situation in, in uh, Asia Pacific and also the Indian Ocean, uh, in particular, coming from the region, actually. Um, with the recent challenges, you have already mentioned regarding the 
maritime security, etc. But uh, at the same time, uh, for the ASEAN uh, and the Southeast Asian region, uh, the challenges would be maybe quite different regarding how to maintain the uh, peaceful and stability in, in, in the region. So that's why ASEAN uh, offer a different approach where introduce uh, the outlook uh, of the Indo-Pacific. So if I may uh, uh, ask your more uh, comments regarding this, uh, I know that uh, we, in, in trying to, to introduce this, also, if I may also, the ASEAN representative in Ottawa will have this uh, seminar on the Indo-Pacific outlook in next Monday. So it would be also an interesting uh, forum for, for us to have this discussion. But at this time, if I may have your comments regarding uh, the different approach by ASEAN, because it's regarding the inclusivity, regarding the connectivity, connectivity with the uh, and also recognizing the major powers, not in the, on, only the Pacific, but also the Indian Ocean. So um, if I, again, if I may have your more comments about this. Well, I think we'll start with those three, and uh, maybe we'll just have some uh, quick responses, and uh, we'll get another uh, round of questions. So, uh, Greg, do you want to start uh, with? Uh... Um, for those of us who are not claimants of the South China Sea, our interests are in, as you indicated, defense of the rules-based order and international law, primarily. For the U.S., there is an additional imperative to not lose our credibility as a regional defense provider, especially in the case of the Philippines, right? If, if you got to a place where either Chinese force was used against the Philippines and the U.S. didn't respond, or if the Filipinos were unwilling to contest Chinese action because they assumed the U.S. won't respond, in either case, that alliance is dead and with it an awful lot of U.S. credibility, um, which I think, frankly, would be bad for everybody, not just the U.S. But on the international rules part, I think the debate here ultimately comes down to do you believe that the post-World War II system, founded on the idea of co-equal states, cooperating under a regime of agreed upon international laws, including the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, which is the most universally accepted piece of international legislation since the UN Charter, do you believe that that has undergirded the last 80 plus years of peace and prosperity by any marker, the most prosperous period in human history? Or is that simply an aberration, uh, a, a byproduct of US dominance of the system? If you believe the latter, then your argument is likely, well, China's just doing what great powers always do, overturning the rules, setting their own. It's no different than the Dutch overthrowing the Portuguese and the British overthrowing the Dutch. If, as I do, you believe that that system is more than that, that it is, in fact, worth fighting for, then the South China Sea is a line you simply must draw on the sand. Because what China is doing in the South China Sea is effectively saying that all states are no longer equal. A certain set of rules applies outside of Asia. The regime of rules under the UN, WTO, and UNCLOS set work for China. But within China's near waters, international law ends. And a new regime in which everybody is subservient to China's will begins. And that includes the Philippines not having an easy, Vietnam not having an easy, China being free to use force, and it is force. They sunk a fishing boat full of 22 Filipinos and left them to die in June. They just deployed 40 Coast Guard and fishing vessels to intentionally create the risk of collision for Vietnamese civilian actors ever since July. They've deployed over 100 militia boats continuously around Thetu Island and the Spratly since last December. This is force. It's just not the force that threatens the U.S. Senate. I don't think that we as an international community are prepared to accept the repercussions that come from us accepting that that is the new reality in Asia. Do you have a, a hot pursuit on that? Okay. Uh, Tom, did, did you want to talk a little bit on the China, India? I mean, sure. Can I, and I, can I also just kind of follow up on Greg's point? I think there is this also broader question of lack of trust these days in the region when it comes to China saying that it's committed to certain things. Essentially, what they've done is a unilateral change of a status quo in the region. They have tried this also with their territorial border disputes. Uh, but that's what they've done. And if we criticize the Russians for annexing Crimea, 
This is essentially also a unilateral change in a status quo, um, despite international law on the subject. I don't think too many people believe that China won't impede commerce if it so sees it in its interest. I don't think people in the region, or many in the region, not all, believe that it will not use its economic uh, presence in the region and its um, uh, kind of uh, physical presence in the region down the line because it's used economic persuasion or coercion to ensure that countries uh, gel with its approach. And I think there's this broader aspect, which is it's something the Indian Foreign Secretary said last year, which is things that China said it would not do in recent years it has done, partly because its own presence is expanding. And the two instances he gave is they said they were never going to send troops abroad. Well, there are Chinese troops abroad now. They said that the second example he gave is China said it was never going to um, uh, set up a base abroad. It has a base abroad uh, in Djibouti. Um, and it is a military base. When Xi Jinping shows up there in a uniform, it is a military base. And I think you could stretch that and, and take it further and say, you know, when they said that they weren't going to interfere in countries' politics, well, when you're starting to determine who is at the head of Zambia and Zimbabwe, you're interfering in countries' politics. So I think there, are, there is that broader issue of trust these days, and there is a questioning of that, and that's something Beijing has to deal with. And it is partly, not entirely, but partly, caused by, in large part, by its own behavior. Um, on India and China, um, I think the reason you see Prime Minister Modi engaging with, um, a similar to kind of Prime Minister Abe, um, with uh, Pre President Xi, Chairman Xi, General Secretary Xi, whatever your preferred term for him is, um, is partly, in large part, because India would like to take advantage um, of China's economy. It would like economic en engagement to grow. Uh, China is India's second largest trading partner. Investment, uh, Chinese investment in India is still quite small. Uh, China would like it to grow. Um, but this relationship that India has with China, this economic relationship, which there had been very much like there was in the US, that growing economic ties would help alleviate some of the political tensions, that has not actually worked out. Economic friction has been added to the list of problems that the two countries have, mostly because it's not quite an interdependent relationship. It is a dependent relationship to a large degree. Um, India's trade deficit with China is uh, about kind of 56, 57 billion dollars out of their total kind of 90 billion dollars in trade. It is India's largest trade deficit. Um, India has concerns uh, about its companies not getting market access in China. Uh, whereas Chinese companies want to invest in kind of the Indian tech um, sector and pharma, uh, and have been allowed to, as as you saw, as you mentioned, kind of the number of companies uh, telecom in the telecommunication side. So I think there is this sense, and you saw the two sides declare that they were going to set up this um, mechanism to take economic ties forward. Uh, but there are some fundamental kind of differences that have to be sorted out at the kind of political level. On the economic side, there has to be a decision to give Indian companies market access, Indian agricultural products uh, allowed to be kind of, or if China starts importing them. Those have not been resolved, and one sign of this was uh, that uh, India walked away, at least for now, from RCEP. Because that, India's concern about that is that it was essentially a free trade agreement with China, and it cannot afford to sign one right now. There is also concern about China potentially using economic ties uh, for kind of to change India's behavior politically or strategically. And one thing that was noticed in Delhi uh, last year is when the pubs, some people in the public were calling for a boycott of certain Chinese goods, including phones, the Chinese embassy released a statement saying India, Indian companies need to remember uh, that essentially that China can kind of hurt their interests. Um, so does Prime Minister Modi want to do more? Do Indian companies want to do more with China? Absolutely. Uh, is India using its market? Uh, access to potentially try to get China to kind of uh, change its behavior? Absolutely. Um, but that kind of idea that that was going to be the dominant part of the relationship lead to much greater engagement, we haven't seen that pan out. Sounds great. Um, anybody want to uh, talk on the question from the embassy from Indonesia? Julia, do you want to yes, talk very, on that? Yes, very briefly. Um, 
um, since um, ASEAN um, adopted the, uh, the ASEAN outlook for Indo-Pacific, um, there has been criticism about this outlook that is, uh, is too general, it's, um, it's not a strategy for member countries to, um, to use, um, uh, and also it focused too much on economic, on, um, um, on sustainable development, and uh, not enough on the security aspect of that. Um, so I, um, but then I think from an ASEAN perspective, um, this is what make ASEAN united and um, cohesive up until this point. Um, but also um, we have to recognize that uh, there are increasing um, and complex issues in the region. And this is precisely the challenge for Vietnam next year as ASEAN chair. Um, so I think it remains to be seen how, how Vietnam could balance um, the, these competing interests um, in, in, the, in the region. Uh, but from a Canadian perspective, um, I think that um, ASEAN countries, um, many countries would like to reduce um, over-dependence um, economically on China and also to find ways to ensure that uh, the region is peaceful. So if Canada can look at, uh, look at this from the ASEAN view, ASEAN needs, and support ASEAN, then uh, that is a value that, that, that Canada can bring um, to ASEAN. Thank you. Yeah, that's great. Uh, how about another round of questions? So if you, you could just uh, please uh, do line up to the mic and, uh, and again, uh, introduce yourself and uh, please keep it uh, crisp. Okay, I think I can keep it crisp. I'm one of the older people in the room here and I am a committee member of the International Organization to End Transplant Abuse in China. And um, so this is all dear to my heart, and I have one simple question. You've mentioned like values. You've mentioned the word diplomacy. You've mentioned the word negotiate. You've mentioned uh, many words like that. How do you negotiate with a regime? How are you diplomatic with a regime that has killed 60 to 100,000 people to harvest their organs? With, obviously without consent, and the country that has two, they say one, two, two million of their citizens in concentration camps. And so how can you trust them to do anything that they say they're going to do? And you mentioned okay. that they don't. Okay, so well, I how thank can you. Negotiate with yeah, thank you. Yeah, question. thank you. Thank you for that question. I, I mean, that's a big, big question, and um, I don't know that we'll be able to handle that broader question. But uh, if if there are any thoughts, um, I guess I'll I'll take a swing at part of it. Um, look, you you do it with open eyes, right? Understand that China is not a nation of rule of law domestically. It is a nation of rule by law. The leadership in Beijing uses and discards law and regulation as necessary as a tool of power, and they treat international law the exact same way. In China's mind, there is no such thing as binding international law. There are political expedients that they will wrap up in the language of, of legality. However, China is, like every state, aware of its interests, uh, aware of costs and benefits in what it does. In the same way that it was possible, at the height of a zero-sum containment strategy with the Soviet Union, it was possible for us to negotiate on things like the INCSI agreement to prevent, you know, accidental nuclear war over instance at sea. You can adjust Beijing's cost-benefit analysis. You can impose enough cost and present enough politically face-saving off-ramps that China will seek compromise on certain issues. You also have to be clear about the issues where it will not compromise. But you do not have to you can find the regime reprehensible, you can find its actions reprehensible, you can still accept that there is very little alternative here other than negotiation and diplomacy and international pressure. Because what else are you supposed to do? Give China carte blanche to do whatever it wants to its smaller neighbors or fight a war that nobody wants? The only thing between those two is diplomacy. 
Yeah, and I, and I would just add that, I mean, China does care about its reputation. I mean, it's, it may be hard to change its mind on certain issues, but reputational costs, I think, do impact China. So there are ways to kind of edge that calculus. Let's get some more questions, um, and then, uh, unless you really had a quick well, point just, on that. I think one thing, and this is, you know, Greg's point, don't trust, ver ver verify. But you have to, I mean, especially if you're in the neighborhood, you can't change the reality that China is the biggest neighbor that you have. Uh, and for countries that are not in the neighborhood, it is, as you said, kind of the biggest economic partner. Um, but I think what like-minded countries, major powers in the region, minor powers in the region need to do is to make sure um, that they do this is where collective action would be helpful. Um, for example, there are more countries, in my opinion, should have signed letters asking for the release of the Michaels, and not just a few, because what that actually can shape Chinese behavior if everybody got together. Because the moment you play, can play divide and rule, and you can say, we, can, we, will, um, we will reward people who do not sign on to these things, but we have seen, as Greg said, that they ha there is a way to shape Chinese behavior. And arguably, this is when you ask people in the Quad, what, are you, what is your goal? It is to ensure that China resists doing certain, deterring China from doing certain things. So it's not even kind of already things that it's already doing, but deterring it from taking that step in the first place. Great. Uh, let's uh, have some more questions. I see uh, Michael there waiting. But to others, uh, please uh, feel free to line up if you have other questions. Uh, Michael, uh, please. All right. Well, good morning. Thanks to all for the great panel. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm Michael Cole. I'm Taipei based senior fellow with McDonald Laurie Institute and the Global Taiwan Institute in Taiwan. Uh, I like the comment on the coalition of uh, the willing and the capable. Uh, I find it extraordinary that you have a democratic partner in Asia that is both willing and capable, and that is Taiwan, and yet oftentimes is uh, completely ignored by like-minded partners uh, in the region and, and globally as well. Uh, it has a sizable navy, probably the largest after American, uh, Chinese, and Japanese in that part of the world. Uh, it is a claimant in the dispute in the East China Sea. It is a claimant in the dispute in the South China Sea. It's part of the first Allen chain. Uh, as I said, it's, it's arguably the most vibrant democracy in the region, and yet the level of engagement is nowhere near where it should be. Uh, so what is it going to take uh, for the international community to finally uh, engage Taiwan in a way that serves Taiwan's interests, but also serves uh, the interests of the international community? Great question. Uh, please. Uh. Uh, just a quick one. Mary is Grinius. I was the ambassador to North and South uh, Korea, uh, Vietnam, earlier. The, um, not much has been mentioned about Russia, uh, another maritime power in the Pacific region. But uh, certainly, I, I still look at uh, Russia as, as China's junior partner. Uh, a specific question, Chinese uh, Russian naval exercises, not only in the Pacific, but in the Mediterranean, in the Black Sea, and in the Baltic. And all of it, of course, for the, for the benefit of both to keep the United States geopolitically off balance. Comments, please. Thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Jan Top Christensen. I just uh, very recently arrived in Canada because of my Canadian wife. I uh, resigned from uh, Danish Foreign Service uh, at the end of August. The last five years I was in Manila as uh, ambassador. I've also served as a Danish ambassador in the Middle East. Um, I have a comment and uh, a question. I can't help uh, using my two experiences as ambassador in, in different regions. Uh, comparing what's happening right now in South China Sea, where uh, China is using what has been uh, labeled uh, salami uh, tactics, techniques. We've seen the same happening in the Middle East over the last many years, successfully done by Israel, accepted by the international community, grudgingly, but accepted. We saw yesterday uh, the US uh, even now accepting the illegal occupation of the West Bank. Why should we expect something would 
uh, be different when it comes to now China's behavior. We have, as international community, behaving, been behaving inconsistently. We have not lived up to our own standards, the rule-based system, as we have defined and often referring to. This is a common. Then my very specific question, is Canada ready to be part of the Navy maritime operation in South China Sea? I agree on the fact that the more can be part of that, together with the US, with France, with UK, uh, the more difficult it will be for China to move forward with its uh, salami technique. I should say, having spent five years observing uh, diligently what's happening in the South China Sea, I'm a little bit uh, pessimistic when it comes to stopping uh, and preventing uh, uh, China to actually fulfill its strategy. And there will be no code of conduct agreement until China is in full control of the South China Sea. Thank you very okay, much. Thank you uh, very much. So we have uh, Taiwan, uh, Russia, China, and uh, and Canada in the, in the South China Sea. So. Uh, uh, Jim, could I ask you first to just uh, make some, uh, to start off, um, obviously that last question a bit uh, on, on Canada's uh, role. I mean, obviously we are, we do have operations in that theater, um, but whether it's, whether um, the ambassador is referring to freedom of navigation operations or, or more specific things, but well, can you tell us a little bit about uh, Canada's involvement in that region, in the South China Sea, in the Navy? Yes, uh, thank you, Jonathan. Um, there have been a number of transits by Canadian warships across the South China Sea in recent years, uh, either singularly or in company with other uh, allied uh, nations. Um, speaking personally, uh, I uh, have encouraged uh, the Navy to test Chinese aspirations because without risk of going into a long theological discourse on the law of the sea and the maritime entitlement of certain features, um, in many cases, uh, one should be able to sail within 12 miles or whatever of almost any feature in the South China Sea without, in fact, uh, breaking any uh, international uh, legislation. Uh, that's been a prescription which was a bit too rich for many of my colleagues, but nonetheless, uh, uh, Canadian ships have in fact uh, sailed close to um, uh, Chinese uh, maintained uh, artificial features. Uh, they have been uh, shadowed and challenged, uh, and the same is true in a transit recently of the uh, Taiwan Strait. And in fact, uh, the Americans have made a variety of uh, transits uh, recently. So um, again, there's the maintenance of the pretense uh, with, from Beijing's perspective. Uh, pretense, of course, which was completely dismissed by the uh, arbitral ruling in July of uh, 2016. Um, On uh, Taiwan, could I ask uh, Greg and um, Hikotani since if you could just tell a little bit, uh, it, you know, if you're not aware, it's okay, but a little bit about Japan's relationship with Taiwan and whether you feel like this is how they're looking at this. Uh, um, I know Taiwan is not explicitly referenced in uh, in Japan's free and open Indo-Pacific approach, but I think it's a it's a good point by Michael. And from the U.S. perspective, uh, how obviously uh, you're looking at Taiwan and the Indo-Pacific strategy, probably more directly referenced. But uh, Greg, if you can kind of chime in on that, and then we'll get to uh, China Russia afterwards. Um, <clears throat> so this is difficult because Taiwan is in a unique position. Nobody else in the region faces a constant threat of artillery barrages and amphibious landings if they push things too far. This is a uniquely Taiwanese problem. And so when we rank the priorities of regional states, Taiwan's are not gonna match up to those of Southeast Asia or Japan or the US. There are roles for Taiwan, but I think primarily the role of Taiwan from the US perspective, and I would also argue from a Japanese perspective, is preservation of Taiwan's autonomy. Taiwan serves as proof of the lie of the fundamental principles underlying CCP rule, which are the Chinese citizens are not capable of democratic governance. Uh, as was referenced earlier, I think increasingly we're seeing that the Chinese hope of peaceful reunification is a pipe dream, as especially events in Hong Kong make it all but impossible to imagine uh, that future. And so increasingly the situation around Taiwan is going to get more and more dangerous as China sees that the possibility of peaceful reunification has disappeared. 
And so the primary goal of the U.S. is going to remain, how do we deter, dissuade China from using over military force against Taiwan? Taiwan's ability to operate on the other issues that we've talked about, BRI, well, Taiwan does not really do large-scale infrastructure investment. Um, Taiwan does not have a seat and is not going to have a seat in negotiations led by ASEAN, given their one China policy. Taiwan has a very awkward position on the South China Sea. Uh, the Ma government's opposition to the arbitral ruling was frankly damaging to Taiwan's international reputation. The Tsai government realized that. Their current preference is to not talk about the South China Sea because to do so either upsets domestic political constituents or upsets their partners in the US and Japan. And the one thing that Taiwan could do that the US did for a while push on was release the documentation from 1928 to 1947 proving that the Nine Dash Line was never more than a claim to the islands. It was never a claim to airspace and seabed and waters. And Taiwan will quietly acknowledge that. It will never say it in public. It's worthwhile that Taiwan has never claimed as China has historic rights in the Nine Dash Line. But if you're a Taiwan, what is the benefit there? If you release those documents, you're going to infuriate Beijing, resulting in further economic and diplomatic retaliation. And the ASEANs are not suddenly going to say, OK, you can be part of the code of conduct process. So there is relatively little payoff to the one thing Taiwan could do in the South China Sea. Uh, Jim, I want to quickly add? I'd draw your attention to an excellent slim volume by Bill Hayton, uh, Dr. Bill Hayton, on the South China Sea. And what commends it particularly is that Hayton goes back to first principles. He goes back to the documents in the 1920s and shows how these have been misinterpreted either by design or accident repeatedly uh, and distorted to the point where they then serve China's purposes. So it's a very interesting illustration in historical research in terms of determining the legitimacy of claims and where they originate from. Hayton, H-A-Y-T-O-N, Bill, William Hayton. He's in the UK. The book you. is called South China Sea. Yes. <laughs> it's very simple. After the face in the nine dash line, that's what the, the yeah. third thing we see in the book. Uh, so um, I don't have much to add um, to Greg about the Taiwan. It's just that I'm not too sure what the kind of things that you have in mind as what Japan can do more towards China would actually be helpful to Taiwan or in terms of Japan-China relations, um, it's actually too close. And I think the free and open in the Pacific not being extended or not even trying to be extended to either South Korea or Taiwan is a point to me. Made. There's been redrawing of the map in various ways of what is in, but it hasn't really reached that. But, um, but I think, you know, it, it, I'm not, I think it's kind of too close and too difficult to actually try to include that in that concept from a Japanese point of view. Um, just to touch upon um, the question raised earlier about um, um, China's type of regime it is, and is that um, I think that um, the coalition of the capable and willing as well as the collective action problem that you raise is that I think we're on the same page in terms of not making it easier for China to unilaterally change the status quo in the way it has and to give a choice for countries in the region to help them to make not, make not make it happen. And that's the role of the partner countries, which I think we, we, tell, we hold the same kind of role. So in relation to um, how do we diplomatically or ne negotiate with countries like China, I think one answer is we don't have a choice. And the other is that maybe through diplomacy with other countries, that's one way we can communicate with China that what they're doing, it cannot be unilaterally withhold. And one example of that is how um, a number of countries highlighting the problems with, for example, Belt and Road contracts has helped countries like Malaysia be able to renegotiate better terms, or, for example, um, the State Department helping Myanmar write a better contract for a deal that they were going to sign. Um, so I think there are ways to kind of shape behavior. Um, just on the kind of China-Russia point, I, actually, I think one of the big questions that we are going to face and I think we don't have the answer to and I think many people have because it will determine the shape of kind of in the Indo-Pacific in some ways is what happens to the China-Russia relationship. Um, and there is a live debate um, on this issue. Does this relationship get deeper? Um, not just the, uh, and to add to your list of uh, maritime exercises, China and Russia are about to do one or just done one with South Africa as well. Um, does it get deeper? Um, and there are signs of that. 
um, not just these exercises, cooperation in the defense space, technology, um, or does it? Do we see another Sino-Russian split down the line? And when do we see it? Because that will be crucial, as we did during the Cold War. A country like India is hoping and putting its in best bets on the latter that there will be a split not least because there will be military implications for India if there isn't a split and India has, has to engage in hostilities with China, given its legacy systems. And that is the logic for India, and I would say Japan, as well as countries like France, to be engaging with Russia and making sure that they have kept the door open. Um, because, and you, uh, Prime Minister Modi went to um, Vladivostok recently and has unveiled this act Far East, and if part of it is just trying to get the Russians to think about themselves as an Indo-Pacific actor, that even though they sometimes kind of, as and I agree with the point, I don't think anybody has, you know, can speak with uh, uh, purity on the values question. I think all the countries we've mentioned today have kind of fallen short. Um, but I think, you know, on the kind of Russia side, the idea of, because the Russians have taken the Chinese line on the Indo-Pacific, that this is a Western-imposed, kind of uh, US-imposed uh, concept. Um, poor Japan doesn't get any, any credit. But that it, they don't want to be part of it. But just like Taiwan, Russia, too, it doesn't have to sign on or be official part of things. Russia is already involved. It's involved because it helps um, sell military and provide military equipment to India, Indonesia, and Vietnam, things the US doesn't like. But, it, but nonetheless, that is helping with capacity in those countries. Um, it is involved in the sense that it is also kind of um, has had uh, military engagement with a number of these countries, not just the three mentioned, um, over the course of time. It is involved by its sheer presence, and down the line, it could be a balancer as it, uh, it was during the Cold War to China. Um, I think there's a live debate, because even in a country like India, there are questions about whether India can create a wedge, or Russia is too far down along that line, uh, at least as long as Putin and Xi are at the kind of, um, head of their countries. But I think that is actually one of the major questions we don't have an answer to yet. Well, I think, uh, Tanvia, I'm fortunately I'm going to have to leave you with the last word because we are out of time. But uh, as you can see, there's the, the questions do never end on this uh, topic. But um, I do, uh, before um, we, we finish up, um, just an administrative note, I think that you see uh, on your chairs, or there were on your chairs, a, a little survey there. Uh, I would ask if, if you please had the time to, to fill that up as it would be very helpful for us. Uh, as we go forward and continue our Indo-Pacific work. Um, there's some pens in the desk if you don't have them. Um, again, thank you everyone for, for coming out uh, today. And uh, MLI is committed to continuing. Uh, the Indo-Pacific is a very important part of, uh, of our foreign policy work. And we're going to be continuing to do events uh, similar to this and like this. So we may very well call on uh, many of our, our guests here to kind of come back and continue this conversation. So again, thank you, everyone, and, uh, and have a great day.